Um, I'm, I'm not going to read every line of this because uh, I think, well, let me ask you the, the ones who've taken it for credit. Have you read the syllabus? Have, have you read it yet? Okay. You haven't read it? Okay. Okay. Um, well, just make sure, I'll be summarizing it, just make sure to read it right after class tonight and before tomorrow morning. Um, so, um, as you do the readings, I suggest that you take some notes if you want to, especially as those readings uh, help you to know how better to interpret the old and the new. Okay? Um, so, uh, in that last paragraph on page one, I, I talk about taking notes from your readings. If you own the books, just underline and, and, and take notes in the margins. Um, and by the way, there is a book that's, that's going to be important to read. It's by C.H. Dodd, according to the scriptures. And um, we, we do have that book. Uh, I think it's now electronically online. Has anybody tried to find it yet? Um, well, we'll talk more about that. We, we have some hard copies of that book. Uh, it's, it's a book that's no longer in print, but you can occasionally find it uh, at used booksellers if you go on Amazon, but it's, it's kind of expensive. So if, if you find it, but it's too expensive, then, you know, avail yourself of the book here. I think it is on reserve, but I'll double check that um, at, a, at, a, at a break on electronic reserve, I mean. Um, so, uh, but that's a very, it's about 150 pages. It's a very important book in this, in this field. Um, <clears throat> page two, uh, you especially ought to know very well the uh, articles by Richard Longenecker and by me, which are the last two chapters in my book, The Right Doctrine from the Wrong Texts. And, um, and by the way, you'll, you'll notice, just turn to page 15, um, the bottom line of the reading requirements uh, is given to you right there at the end of the course, and that is when you turn your exegesis paper in, we're going to give you a couple extra months to do that and to finish the reading if you've begun the reading. I was hoping that some of you might uh, be able to start the reading before you come, but, you know, um, that may not have been the case. Um, so these are all uh, the readings. You'll just turn this sheet in with your exegesis paper, and if you read everything, you just put a check mark by it. And uh, now my book is the fourth one down on page 15, The Right Doctrine from the Wrong Text. And um, this, uh, the last two chapters of that book uh, are one is by Richard Longenecker and the other by me. So you really, you really want to pay close attention because uh, what's going on in, in, in those two articles represents uh, a significant percentage of the kind of debate that goes on uh, uh, even among evangelicals when interpreting Old Testament texts in the New. So you'll be expected to turn that in with your, um, uh, with your term paper. So, um, so those are the readings that, 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 that you'll be especially um, accountable for. I'll, I'll make just a comment about some of those if you're still on page 15. I've already mentioned Dodd. Very important. It's a groundbreaking work in, in Old and the New, but it's, a, it's an old book. I mean, it's, it's like from 1951, and uh, he was a uh, professor at Cambridge University. He's not, was not an evangelical, but uh, his approach to interpreting Old and the New is very, very good. And uh, many scholars have rejected his views. Many scholars have accepted the his views, and so as a result, there's a lot of debate on this. And his view is that when a New Testament writer quotes the Old Testament, he quotes it uh, in line with the original meaning of the Old Testament, and he doesn't twist it or give it a new meaning that an Old Testament author would have had no idea about. Uh, so uh, th that's a lot about what this course will revolve around. The New Testament writers uh, interpret the Old Testament in a way that's consistent with the Old Testament meaning or uh, do they twist it? Um, and some evangelicals say, yeah, they twist it. They read absolutely new meanings in, even contradictory meanings, but they were inspired by the Holy Spirit because they say God does not inspire interpretative method. He inspires results. That's why I titled my book, Right Doctrine from Wrong Texts, because there are a lot of uh, uh, scholars 
including significant evangelical scholars like Richard Longenecker, like Dan McCartan, who indeed used to teach here, who would say they read absolutely new and even contradictory meanings into the New Testament, but it's still inspired uh, because God inspires conclusions and not method. And we'll talk about that. I think there's a, a fallacy in, 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 that, in, that, in that view. But uh, that, that's what this is going to revolve around. And then if you look at France's book, um, there on page 15, second item, uh, France's book was very, uh, uh, it was really his dissertation. It was published like in the late 60s, and uh, it's on Jesus' use of the Old Testament. So you'll get a good introduction to Jesus' use of the Old Testament from, uh, from this book. He, he, he died two or three years ago of, I believe, either liver or pancreatic cancer, about the age of 74, 75. He's a very good, uh, a very good scholar and, um, and an acquaintance of mine. Um, La Rondel, The Israel of God and Prophecy. This revolves around the issue of how do dispensationalists uh, interpret the old and the new. And by dispensational, all I really mean by that is those who don't see the church as Israel. So they don't see um, the church as fulfilling the prophecies of Israel, but that there's going to be a coming messianic kingdom, and right before that kingdom, right after a rapture, then uh, the time clock for Israel starts again, and that's when Israel, on into the millennium, will fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. During the church age, it's a mystery time, and uh, the church does not fulfill uh, the promises of the Old Testament. Um, and I'll talk more about that, especially about a, a, a relatively new movement, and now it's pretty old, but progressive dispensationalism. What's the difference between that and, and classic dispensationalism. I mean, just, just to uh, anticipate, basically they would say hey, the latter days have begun with the first coming of Christ. We're not just waiting for them to begin after a future tribulation on the millennium. And um, they begun and the church is inheriting the promises of Israel but not fulfilling the promises so that they are, they're not Israel. And I like to give the illustration there of uh, uh, if uh, the Smiths lived ne next door to me, they don't, but let's say they did, and they had a five-year-old child, and um, they, uh, and we got to know Johnny, you know, he was out in the lawn all the time, we got to know him, and they tragically die in a car accident, and so um, we've grown to really care for Johnny Smith, and so we, we adopt him, but we don't change his name. But when it comes time to make our will, and then when we die, we're going to divide our inheritance into four parts instead of three, since we have three children, four parts. Um, our three children will get the inheritance because they're legal beals and even indeed ethnic beals, right? I mean, they're from our blood. But Johnny Smith uh, never changed his name and we didn't change it. So he's not a legal beal and he's not an ethnic beal, but he gets the promises, he gets the inheritance. So they, th that's the example given to me by a, a scholar who's a progressive dispensationalist. So the church inherits the promises, but that doesn't make them Israel. Just like Johnny Smith inheriting our inheritance doesn't make him a Beal. Uh, I think it's an excellent illustration. I think it works. The only problem with it is I think it's not scriptural. Um, I think that scripture uh, talks about what's called adopted sonship. Uh, Romans 8, Galatians 4. I mean, that's actually a change of name. And when we're adopted, our names are changed and we come into the family of Christ. And if Jesus is true Israel, then so are we. Uh, we become what He is. So I like the illustration. I, I, I tweak the illustration of Johnny Smith. Uh, he lives next door. Uh, we've grown fond of him. Tragically, his parents die in a car accident. And we want him to come and live with, with us because we really, we really care for Johnny Smith. And we adopt him and change his name to Johnny Smith Beal. Not a hyphen, but Johnny Smith Beal. And so when we die, uh, he gets that inheritance because though he's not an ethnic Beal, he is a legal Beal and gets to along with our children. So, but that, you know, that's the progressive dispensationalists will, will debate. And they, of course, they'll say their, their view is scriptural uh, because they're, they're very biblical. And, and believe in inerrancy, and so 
So that's sort of kind of the idea of the debate, and, and La Rondelle will talk about that. And uh, this is written at uh, not the most scholarly level, but I think it's a, a good level. Uh, then my right doctrine from wrong text basically is taking books and, and articles, mainly articles um, and portions of books um, that debate this issue of does the New Testament, do the New Testament writers interpret the Old Testament in line with, it, with its meaning or not? And so you have a group of scholars who say, yeah, they did interpret it in line with the meaning of the Old Testament, and others who I've included in here, no. They didn't, and, and some scholars I have in here are not evangelicals. Um, so, um, um, at, at any rate, and, and, so, and some who are not evangelicals argue the New Testament writers did understand what they were doing and, 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 and interpreted consistently. Uh, but then others will argue, no, they didn't. So you got a real mix. This is not just what I call an in-house evangelical debate. It's also outhouse, if you will. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not just evangelicals disagreeing with one another, but actually non-evangelical scholars disagree with one another on this issue. Um, so, uh, Dan McCartney, should we employ the hermeneutics of the New Testament writers? You'll see that that's uh, online on the course site. Has everybody gotten on the course site yet? Because it's really important. If you haven't, just let me know at the break and, and I'll help you on that. Okay, because that, that's, that's going to be um, uh, your lifeline. That'll, that, that you'll, you'll find when I'm lecturing, I'll say, okay, go to this handout, and I'll tell you where to go. Uh, do this reading, and so forth and so on. Okay, so that's, that's your lifeline, all right? Um, so uh, at, the, at the break, before we go to dinner, if anybody hasn't gone to the online course site, let me know, and if there's a problem first thing in the morning, I may not be able to solve it. I'm not a IT person, believe me. Um, <laughs> my wife knows it better than I, and so does Sam M., who uh, is running the technological show here at Westminster. Um, now, <clears throat> so McCartney uh, has written an article. He interacts with me in it, and he disagrees with me. He's, uh, he, he's an evangelical Presbyterian, as I say, who used to teach here. And actually, this has been a long-running debate at Westminster Theological Seminary. Um, well, it's not anymore, <laughs> but it used to be. It used to be, okay? Um, uh, so, uh, now, the next book is a handbook on the New Testament use of the old. Uh, again, one might call that another lifeline of this course. This is going to tell you how to write the exegesis paper. And on, on, on the online course site, I give an in-depth outline that summarizes it. And, and I'm going to show you, I give an abbreviated, out, abbreviated outline that I want you to use when writing your paper so that you'll make sure that you hit each point, okay? Um, and I think especially in such a short course, I want to give you that kind of a, a help because um, this is a short course on, on a difficult topic, okay? Okay. Um, so this very, very uh, of course, I, I, I guess I shouldn't say it's very important since I wrote it. And that's, <laughs> that sounds self-serving, I know. But, uh, but basically, that, that book was uh, written from the lecture notes of this course. Though, you know, I'm, I'm not just giving the book in this course now, but basically it's um, uh, a lot of it is, is given. For example, we'll talk about ways, we'll start out today talking about ways the Old Testament uses the new. There are 12, at least 12 different ways, probably more, but at least 12 and subcategories of them. And, um, and I'll expand on that in the book so that um, if you've already read it, great, you'll follow me even better. Uh, if you haven't read it, you ought to try to read that chapter after uh, this evening if, if you have time. If you don't, again, the bottom line is to read all this stuff by uh, August 19. So um, the next article, uh, and I'm sorry I have so many articles by myself, um, <laughs> but at any rate, um, um, the use of Hosea 11.1 and Matthew 2.15 is one of the most debated passages among, among scholars, both non-evangelical and evangelical, 
and I'll have you read something on that. We'll do that toward the end of the course, and, and then I'll, I'll go over it. Um, uh, the cognitive peripheral vision of biblical authors, it appears sometimes, and the old and the new is not easy. That I, I, I understand why some people think New Testament writers misinterpret the old because there's some tough, tough passages. Mm -hmm. And so um, that article, Cognitive Peripheral Vision of Biblical Writers, um, is about the writers who, when they quote an Old Testament specific passage, actually their peripheral interpretative vision is much wider with regard to the book. And they may go even four chapters later to interpret that verse from chapter 1, let's say. And so it looks like they're importing a new idea that wasn't in mind by the writer in chapter 1. But of course, since it occurs in the book, there is some sort of what I call organic link between what that writer says in later chapters and this. And I compare it to... Uh, peripheral vision. When you're going down the street, your eyes are right on that road, hopefully. <laughs> it's not always the case in this day of texting, etc., and GPSs. And um, as you're looking, uh, that, that's where your focus is. And as you go wider and wider and wider, um, things become less in focus. But and, and at the widest point, you can you know, that's why it's important when you're a driver to, to have good peripheral vision. You might notice a pedestrian out of the far reaches of, let's say, your, the right part of your peripheral vision. So you can, you can see the pedestrian. So also I compare that to a biblical writer who's focusing on that verse that he quotes, but um, he, he is taking into consideration some of the far extents of his peripheral vision, and he, he may bring that in. Uh, to his direct vision, just as if you see someone, you go like that, you know, say, oh my gosh, what's that person stepping onto the street here? Um, so basically, that's, that's one of my approaches to solving a lot of difficult problems. And it's just another version of saying that context is the key. Not only in this course, but in all my courses, context is the king and the queen, the prime minister, queen, so forth, the governor, etc. And so this is just saying that New Testament writers are aware of even broader context, not just the context of a chapter. And sometimes that may be, it may be so broad it goes to other Old Testament books. Wow. So, um, now some people say that I've created this article uh, just to solve all the problems, you know. And, uh, well, that's kind of true. <laughs> you know, I don't deny that, and I do, but I think it's legitimate. It's, um, so... And then on the, on the back of page 16, S.L. Johnson, Old Testament, the New. You're supposed to read two chapters from this book. It's a little book. And I think it's online again. Um, everything, I think, is ultimately electronic, I think, except for the main textbooks that you have. Um, uh, this is uh, basically I learned under him in, in seminary days. And uh, the basic method that you'll see from me is from him, though I've elaborated, uh, added some more steps. But I'm having you read two chapters anywhere because just to see how he executes the method of old and the new. All right. So let's go down. Um, let's see. To uh, page three. There I talk about the. Required textbooks that we already talked about. Uh, page four. These are just some articles recommended. You don't have to read them just for your own purposes if you want to try to read them at some part. Um, and um, likewise, uh, I have some articles uh, that interact with people who, uh, again, don't see New Testament writers interpreting the Old Testament in line with its original meaning. You know, uh, uh, and, and they import a lot of postmodern philosophy. And all that ultimately means is that everybody has, in this case, everybody has their own presuppositions. Uh, if you put on green sunglasses, you see green. And so that's what they're arguing about New Testament writers. They had on green sunglasses. 
And so they put a green tent on Old Testament text that really had a red tent, all right, or another tent. So they're reading in their own ideas from their own because everybody has lenses. You can't help but read through your lenses. And so they would say that forces everybody, every single person to distort uh, what they read in the old or even what they read in the newspaper. Uh, it's, it's a very pessimistic view of being able to know anything. So, and you'll see, you'll see that. Um, again, that's not required. I used to require a lot of that. Um, but that, that, that engages with that postmodern aspect of use of the old and the new. And then the exegetical paper on page five. Um, I think I'm going to have you probably cross through number six. It's very difficult. So just, you know, um, if, if you were to have done that uh, and, you, you, and if you had had opportunity to do the others, that, that one is, is, I think, too difficult. So I'm not going to have you do number six, but I am going to have you do one of the first five. And um, so the, the, those are the ones available for you to do. I give you the length of the paper, there, 4,500 words, and uh, it's 80% of the grade. Uh, and on page 6.8, it does assume a working knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. Um, and I'm assuming, has, has everybody been to a seminary or, or not? Um, why don't we introduce ourselves, by the way? <laughs> Let's do, that would be a good idea. I'm Greg Beal. Chris Lindsay. Yes. Okay. Good to have you. I'm Mike Osborne. Mike Osborne. Well, yeah, you can tell, say what you do. Yeah. I'm a uh, pastor of a church in Delaware. Um, I'm the Bible okay. Chris is one of our pastors. Great. Uh, I've been at Summer Psychology. Great. Okay. And uh, where did you go to seminary? Okay, great. Okay. Actually, met you one other time. I was going to go to Wheaton. Oh. So I met you at Wheaton. Yeah. And my wife and I decided, well, it's still time to go back to school, so we want to plan a church in Delaware. And then you came to Philadelphia. Oh. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. <laughs> Here we are. All right. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Phil McKinney from. Fairfax, Virginia, about five years ago, uh, uh, lead minister of the church there. Um, did uh, several different schools, but I, I'm, I'm a nerd. I actually ended up getting my PhD from Southern uh, Baptist in Louisville, and I'm doing continuing to grow. Oh, in what area did you do your PhD? Uh, is in family ministry and discipleship. Okay, great. And, uh, so finished up with that. Uh, I'm, I am one of the guys that doesn't have. there and get opportunities to teach at three different schools and just love love helping people understand the gospel and living the gospel. Okay. And how to minister in the church. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and where did you do your basic seminary training? Basic seminary undergraduate was Harding University in Arkansas and then did master's work at Harding Medical School for one year in Memphis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lots in that area. All right. Great. DHM work. All right. Yeah. This is John Miller. I am from Clarksville, Tennessee. I've been there for six years with Lonely Point Church there. I pastored the church um, for about a couple years ago. I did my undergrad at Green Hill Presbyterian. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually working on a Ph.D. on Trustees in Puritan right now. Oh. Hoping to try to translate over. Yeah. Close to finishing that soon. Okay. Maybe here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, Steve. Steve. Steve Young. And I am currently attending Northeast Seminary of Durham this pastoral track. My second is I'm going into third year. I'm on the fourth four year track. <laughs> so uh, halfway through. Um, I am serving um, as an intern at a Presbyterian uh, Christian church. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I know it's too bad. I had time off, so I um, found out that it's you know, time to open up my mind. It's Dr. Gill is how that I want to take all different platforms to be on and learning more during this time. So, thanks. All right, great. All right, it's for my sake again, let's review our first names. It's Chris and Mike. Mike. Okay. Phil. Phil. John. John. And then we've got Steve. Remind me of your name again? Hung Chung. Hung Chung. H U N G? Yeah. C H A N G. Hung Chung. Okay, and if you do me a favor, at least uh, for a while, just sit in the same places so that I, <laughs> so that would be helpful to me. Um, as long as you can see, sure. As long as you can see. I, well, I don't. I think we're all. I think we're all set. So just feel free. Both of you can move up if you want, so you can have uh, something to write on. Okay. Um, let's let's continue with the syllabus then. Um, so as I, as I say, number six point A: knowledge of Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and the knowledge of the exegetical methods taught in this class um, are, are required for the paper. So maybe before the end of the week you ought to come and see me and, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you ought to be aware of the following books. They're, they're found in my uh, handbook, but these books here uh, by Archer, Bratcher, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these are books uh, that will help you discern uh, whether a New Testament writer is quoting from the Hebrew Old Testament or from the Greek Old Testament or from a Hebrew text, te text that's in Qumran or maybe from different versions of the Greek Old Testament or maybe from a very early Jewish tradition. These, uh, th these will help you uh, know that and it's important because if they're not quoting from the Masoretic text, this is, if you will, the standard Hebrew text, then um, if they're quoting, say, from the Greek Old Testament, and it is different from the Hebrew Old Testament, then you have to ask the question, why? Is th what's the purpose of that? How does this uh, add to the interpretation? Now, some would say, well, it contradicts it sometimes. That's what they'll say. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's my experience, however, that usually... Uh, these tend to be interpretative paraphrases using another translation, just as you might use. Uh, a number of us are aware of different, uh, maybe we memorize different verses in different English translations. And um, so uh, it's the same thing here. Um, all right. Page seven. Just uh, note again very clearly that. Um, the paper's due on Friday the 19th of August, and uh, that's when your reading is due as well. So um, I suppose the way uh, you'll, you'll send that paper um, 
to me. Um, make sure you have a copy of it in case it gets lost in the, the ether space or whatever. Um, so send it to me, and, and what, I'll, what I'll do is I, I will print it out and actually um, write comments on it. And um, in, in fact, you know what I'm going to have you do? Um, Just a Word document, but I think I think what I'll have you do is just certify you finished it on the 19th, and on the 20th, um, just mail it to me, the whole thing. Just mail it to me, and as a backup, send me the email, but I, I'd like a hard copy, and I'll, I'll give you... Um, uh, I'll give you my uh, address. I'm going to give you my uh, home address here. Let's see. Let's see, it's uh, it's my name, and then it's five one five. It's a little small. 515 Penlin Clue Bell Pike. It's four words, long street name. And that's in the town of Blue Bell, PA, 19422. So just mail that to my name at that address. Now, I'll talk to the administration if they want to have you mail it to them, and then I'll, I'll let you know. But at this point, this is what we'll uh, be doing. If, if it changes, I'll, I'll let you know with a clear word. Everybody get that? Everybody know? Okay. Um, all right. No problem. Um, oh, what happened there? Went up into the heavenlies. <laughs> and there on page uh, seven, obviously one of the requirements is to attend the lectures of the instructor, participate in class. Um, So uh, we will, when uh, I'll let you know in point number four, um, when Greek and Hebrew translation is expected. We'll go through the syllabus and I'll show you when that is, uh, is the case. Now, there are, number five, there are brief daily class written assignments. And these should not take over uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and what you're to do is to, when I assign, this, this, is, this begins on lecture number four. Uh, so if you turn over to page nine, lecture number four is the first time on Wednesday that I'll be lecturing on a, um, a passage, a specific passage. From, from lecture four onward, we'll be taking Old Testament quotations in the New, and I'll try to be demonstrating the method from Wednesday morning onward. And, uh, and that's the first one. So on, for example, the use of Isaiah 22, 22 and Revelation 3, 7, I'm going to, uh, all, all you're supposed to do is to give me what you think is the interpretative use of this text um, and its theological use. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Okay, what, what's interpretative use and what's theological use? So, um, and, and I don't want more than one paragraph. Okay, so this is not a major assignment at all. This is not, I mean, okay. So, now, um, you'll notice on that particular assignment, I want you to do that uh, uh, before you read my chapter based on the use of Isaiah 22, 22 and Revelation 3, 7. 
I want to start out really clearly. I want the method to be so clear. So you're going to uh, try to do your best to come up with the interpretative use and theological use on your own, your own integrity. Then you'll read my chapter. Then we'll come in and I will lecture on it. I'm not going to repeat everything, but I'll lecture on the highlights and have any questions at that point because uh, I want the method to be very clear. And then, uh, and then we'll move on from there. Um, we also uh, have one of my doctoral students coming in. Um, I'll let you know when that is. Um, okay, so um, that's very important, number five, because the, you're going to have a class participation assignment. So you'll turn those, uh, just one sheet with your name at the top, one paragraph, you'll turn that in at the end of uh, each, each period. Uh, beginning on lecture number four, which is Wednesday. Dr. Yeah. I think we've already read your comments on that. That's okay. Just try to forget it. <laughs> if, you've are, if, you are, if you've already read it, then uh, uh, just, yeah, just do the best. You know, if you remember it and you can't help it, then that's fine. Um, all right. Let's see, page eight. Okay. Top there is just a further explanation of uh, that, that requirement. And then we have the class uh, session um, outline. Uh, we'll start with introduction to the course, methods for understanding the use of the old and the new today. And um, here's some of the important books uh, that, that, that are crucial for, for this interpretative section, though I'm not having you read at all. Um, only Dodd, in fact, and, yeah, only Dodd. Uh, lecture two tomorrow, um, which is 11 to 1 and 2 to 3. That'll be a three-hour session um, on, uh, we'll, we'll continue to talk about uh, uh, introduction to this course, and um, uh, specifically typology, and, um, and I, I say that Matthew must be translated there. If you'll notice the end of the top paragraph where I had a, uh, some sort of problem with indentation. Um, uh, yeah. I'll probably just have you translate three verses. Don't worry about Second Peter. It's very difficult. So on, on, on that one, and you won't have to translate Genesis chapters 1 to 7. Um, okay, and I say that. But, uh, so just, just Matthew 24, 36 to 39 on that one. I may uh, uh, comment the, the, the readings by Davidson and Gopalt are not required. This just is supplemental stuff, if you ever want to go and read it, that relates to typology. Um, and we'll talk about typology. Uh, if I have time, we'll talk about the already and not yet Son of Man. Um, there's no translation that's due there. Uh, session 3, Tuesday, June 21, um, 3 to 5 and 6 to 7. Uh, we'll conclude uh, the introductory material in this course. Uh, there's just so much that, that, that I need to lay out for you before we start specifically lecturing on particular Old Testament quotations in the New. But that will end uh, on uh, Tuesday afternoon, which is tomorrow afternoon. And then after dinner from 6 to 7, we're going to have a library tour. And uh, it's very important that you print out. Uh, and if you don't know how to print out, the library will tell you how to do that. But to print out, um, let's see here. You go, uh, can, can everybody go to the course site so that I can show you this?
Yeah, it must be under another heading. Just a minute. Yeah, if you'll go to, uh, you have to open the third item from the top that says books on reserve, then it says course PDFs. Those are PDFs on reserves of books and articles. Open up various distrib distributions and handouts. Does everybody see that? Open that up. Then you file down. And by the way, I have provided for you audios of uh, uh, s most of the lectures. It's just an audio of, of, of another course I taught back in the year 2000. That was a long time ago. But um, if, if, if you're interested and you want a supplement to this course, you can look at that. Or there, uh, I'll go over some of the same lectures in this if you wanted to um, hear it again as a review after class or in two weeks or whatever. But if you go down you'll find uh, Revised Historical Backgrounds, and that's a one, two, three, four, five, six. It's the seventh item from the bottom. Everybody see that, Revised? Okay, you click on that, and um, this is, these are bibliographical sources for finding um, texts that, in, in Judaism, that use the Old Testament and the New. And, um, so we're going to have a library tour after dinner. I'm going to go through. I'm going to show you the books and show you how to use them. And we're such a small group. It's I I ideal. Often I'm taking like 15 or more students through the library tour, and often they can't, uh, some of them can't, can't see very well what's going on. So I want you to print that out. Uh, and um, if you have a problem, just go to um, uh, the library staff. Tell them who you are and what course you're in. They'll help you print that out. Okay, everybody see that then? Okay, good. Okay. Now, um, then the lecture period four, Wednesday, June 22nd, that's when you begin to uh, do your homework assignments on what is the interpretative use of this Old Testament text and the theological use. Um, and that'll be on uh, Isaiah 22, 22 and Revelation 3, 7. Then lecture five on, uh, also on Wednesday. Um, that'll be from two to five. And um, by the way, you'll be expected to, um, for, for lecture four, to, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to let you know ahead of time, but you, you'll be expected to translate Isaiah 22, 22 in Hebrew and to translate Revelation 3, 7. And, um, and also not just the Hebrew of 22, 22, but the Greek text as well. Now, if uh, some of you don't have a Hebrew text or a Greek text, um, they're in the library and I'll show you uh, where where those are now for the lecture later in the day um, you know uh, I, I want your lunch to be pleasant without too much indigestion so I'm not going to require any any Hebrew any or Greek translation okay I mean this is such a condensed week so uh, I won't require any of that but I want you to read the English texts okay Please read the English text for that. So it's about Israel's unbelief. Then uh, page 10, lecture 6, which is Thursday, 11 to 1, and 2 to 3, which is it's a three-hour lecture. That is when my doctoral student, a guy named Todd Scasewater, who's doing a, is wrapping up a doctoral dissertation on the use of Psalm 6818 in um, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 8, remember that one where it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, he gave gifts to men. It's very problematic because uh, when it says he gave gifts to men, well, the psalm says he received gifts from men. So what's going on? Paul's reversed it. What's going on here? You know. Um, so uh, he, he's done a good job with uh, working, working on that. 
So for that, you will be expected to translate Psalm 68, 18 in the Hebrew, the Greek, and then just the Greek of Ephesians 4, 8. Okay, so, you know, every day probably you're just going to have three verses to translate. All right. Um, if there's time, I may, be, I may go over the, the notion of mystery in the New Testament. It has a lot to do with um, the use of the old and the new. In fact, I've, a couple of years ago, I came out with a book called Hidden But Now Revealed. It's a biblical theology of mystery. And uh, as we'll see, mystery is very much uh, related to use of the old and the new. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that even this class period. Um, all right. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be reminding you about the translations just to remind you as we as we go um, on Friday, the last day of class, 11 to 1, we have a lecture on the use of Isaiah 49, 6 and Acts 13, 47. Again, just translate that in Hebrew and Greek and then the Acts in Greek. Um, then lecture 9, uh, later in the day from 2 to 4, We'll go over the use of Hosea 11, 1 and Matthew 2, 15. You'll be expected to read the article that's cited there by me. Uh, this is a very, very debated verse, one of the hardest uh, old in the new text. Then I will either lecture on the idea of the temple and the anti-temple in Colossae. Um, uh, you, you will not be expected, by the way, to do any translation. Uh, up there of Hosea 11 or Matthew, okay, because it's just too much to do. We're just going to do the, the first part of Friday will be uh, Isaiah 49, 6 in the Greek and Hebrew and then Acts 13, 47. Uh, from then on, you don't have to translate anything. It's, just, it's too much. Um, but um, uh, on that last hour on Friday, lecture period 10, uh, as I'm designating it, I'll either lecture on, on that topic, the temple and the anti-temple and Colossae, or um, we, we may just have a question and answer session. So uh, obviously as we go throughout the week, if you have questions and answers, I mean, <laughs> you don't need to question them, but if, uh, if, if you have a, a question, you raise them. And uh, if I think think it's better to raise them the last hour of the course, I'll have you do that. So you make sure to write that down. And as things go along after class, write down questions. And if it looks like we have enough, have a sheet that says questions. All right. And uh, if we have enough of those, then we'll just um, do that. Uh, the last hour of the course, I'll be eating some meals with you. So we can also elaborate on some of that at, at meals as well. So we should have plenty of time. If, it, if, if, there are no questions, and I'll I'll, um, I'll discover that the day before, and um, I will uh, lecture on the temple and anti-temple in Colossae. Paul's very concerned about uh, the, uh, Christ and the church being the temple in Colossians, three or four times, uh, about four. He states this, and uh, and uh, I, I think the reason is we we know that there was false teaching in Colossae, and I'll argue that part of the false teaching was they had their own version of experiencing the heavenly temple. And, and, uh, and that's why Paul is so concerned about Christ and the church being the temple, to try to set aright the false views of heavenly visions and participation in this, this temple. They believe those people had a charismatic experience being caught up into heaven and experiencing the angels in the, in the temple. And, and Paul is uh, combating that, which is interesting because Second Corinthians, what is it, chapter 13, says he was caught up into the third heaven, so, you know, uh, interesting. Um, but he says he didn't want to speak about it. The false teachers were speaking a lot, so um, at any rate. Well, you can give him your heaven if you want. When you come back, don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. I didn't. All right. Okay. So now at the bottom, the very bottom, is just about the library tour. This is a very important part of your paper because, uh, well, it's a part of your paper. You, you'll be expected to list the, um, the uses of the Old Testament in Judaism, all right? And um, 
So, and you'll, you'll need to do some research on that. You have to carve out some time um, in the evening or the early mornings uh, to try to gather some of that, that research. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, if, so, um, okay. Everything else is, is, is bibliographical material. So, any any questions about the uh, about the syllabus? So typically every day you're going to have a um, you know you're going to spend twenty. I, I I would say don't spend more than twenty minutes on the hermeneutical or the interpretative use and theological use. And, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. What that is. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about it. No, 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 just those two. Just what we'll, we'll talk about the uh, the method in, in, in just a second. So, so then you know, uh, um, the Greek and Hebrew translation probably. I'm hoping will only take you 30 to 45 minutes. We'll see. Um, uh, so. And then we'll see if we can crowd in some of the, um, the research into Judaism. We may not be able to do it. And at that point, I may say at the end of the week, if you haven't been able to do much in these Jewish sources, um, I may say, well, you have to skip that section. So um, we'll, we'll just see because this is a lot. All right. Now, let's, uh, let's launch off into our first full-fledged uh, lecture. I've actually already begun to lecture. Can I ask more yeah, yeah, please. Um, will you remind us of which passage was to translate yes. prior to? Prior to. I'll always remind you, okay? I'll always remind you. Let me remind you for tomorrow. Let's see if there's one tomorrow. Um, Yes, that's all there is for. Um, no, no, that, yeah, that's that's tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I'm going to cancel that one out. Let's not do that. I, I, I want you to, because the time is so short. I want you to uh, do just prepare. Um, Prepare for uh, Wednesday's lecture, lecture four, and, and start working toward translating Isaiah 22, 22 and Revelation 3, 7. Okay, so I'll just give you a little time on that. All right. And the specifics on what you're wanting in the translation, you want us to write that out? Uh, no, I'll just, I'll just call on you. Just be oral translation. Okay. Yeah. That, that's pretty much it, just oral translation. So you might want to write it out, but I will want you. How many have a Hebrew Bible with them? Uh, we use you can use, yeah. Uh, you have a Hebrew Bible? Do you? Okay, it's on, on computer? Okay, okay, okay. Um, so the only thing that, 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 that I require is that you don't use the cursor for vocabulary and, and grammatical analysis now <laughs> while you're oh. translating <laughs> before of course in fact when students are here they have a book I mean they have the Greek New Testament or the Hebrew old so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a curmudgeon I make them stand <laughs> and they have to just it's them in the text so I'll expect that too but from your computers so that's good that, that should speed up your translation because you got immediate vocabulary immediate grammar Try to analyze it before you use the cursor, though, if you can. But, you know, oh, that, that, that encourages me then. So you've got some good helps there. That, that's good. Excellent. And does everybody have the Greek Old Testament, known as the LXX? Beautiful. Oh, we're looking good. And I am assuming you have a Greek New Testament. Oh, this is great. Okay. I think we're, I think we're um, in good shape there. So that'll speed everything up. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so the first to translate is Isaiah 22, 22, and Revelation 3, 7.
Okay, that'll be on Wednesday. All right. Now, first thing I want to do is to talk about a ninefold approach to interpreting uh, the use of the Old Testament in the New Testament. This is online also, and um, it's right, it's, it's kind of in the middle on the first page menu. What? What email is this on? And it has, it has, um, Well, if, you, if it's too hard to get right now, I'm going to have this on, on the document camera here. Okay. Let me just shift this over. So there's that. So that's, what, that, that's the outline we'll be following. I would, I would try to get uh, uh, hooked up, maybe ask some of your comrades here. How to, how to get linked up at the break or after class or something because this this will be important. All right, let's look at this um, now. Uh, this actually is an outline of your paper, okay? And uh, the first thing you do is uh, you identify the Old Testament reference. Now, hopefully, you won't get that wrong since um, I've given them to you, <laughs> all right? <laughs> now, where, where this really comes into play, though, sometimes um, we have illusions. And if you're going to say, and you're not going to be, you're going to be dealing only with quotations in this course, with the paper. But with illusions, uh, some people would say, well, I'm not sure that's an illusion or not. And so if you're going to identify an Old Testament illusion, uh, then you really have to um, verify that. You have to argue for it. And the main way you do is in two ways. Unique parallel verbal wording and unique theme. So um, uh, in your case, this, this is all set for you, but in terms of illusion, there's a lot of debate about what an illusion is, what's the criteria for an illusion. And um, in each case, it's, you have to consider each uh, uh, a, a proposed illusion on its own. And um, so if, if you have, say, two or three words that are the same and the theme is the same, and those two or three word combinations occur only in your Old Testament passage and in your New Testament passage, well, that may well be an illusion. And you can even have one word if it's unique enough. Sometimes you can have a thought if it's unique enough. So you can see that it's, you know, just you, each one is a case study in and of itself. So I do have a section on identifying quotations and allusions. I have a chapter on that in the handbook. But this is all set for you. The second thing you do that's very important, uh, and again, as I'm going through this, realize, and I would encourage you, uh, at least before you read the, do your paper and the research on it, um, to, 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 to read my handbook, I have a whole chapter on uh, how to interpret, you know, what are the different ways that the old is used in the new. But then this is a chapter on, on just the ninefold approach, okay? And um, uh, that chapter will elaborate on, on this, okay? That's on, uh, let me see. That's... Yeah, that's pages 41 to 55, 41 to 55. Um, okay, let's come back. Yeah, there we are. Okay, um, so secondly, you analyze the broad New Testament context uh, where the Old Testament reference occurs. Now, here's what you do there. It's very important. I'm just going to summarize this for you. My book will explain more 
and I'll try to do that as I lecture. But the first thing you want to do is just an introductory, what's the occasion of this book? You know, why was it written? What kind of problem was there that Paul was trying to um, solve and engage with? And um, uh, now some books, it's hard to know. It's hard to know that in, in the Gospels, for example. Um, in the epistles, it's easier because Paul will actually say he's writing against false teachers. But you don't have explicit statements like that in the, in the Gospels. Um, the second thing you do besides getting the, 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 the occasion um, and, uh, and, and who he's writing to, which will be part of the occasion, uh, what you would do is you would just find an outline of your New Testament book. In a, any commentator, a standard good commentator, and you would just summarize that outline at this point and, and, and try to explain that outline in a kind of logical way, you know, how, how is one chapter relating to another, as best you can. And then uh, you try to say, okay, where does the chapter in which the quotation occurs, where does that fall in the book? Where does it fall in that, that uh, scheme of topics that you're picking up from a, a New Testament commentator? And then what you want to do is you want to try to uh, decide, okay, how does the paragraph, you want to identify how many paragraphs are in that chapter where the quotation occurs. You want to then identify that paragraph uh, and how it relates to the preceding and following paragraphs, thematically and logically, as best you can. Okay? All right. So that's what you do there. Then, thirdly, you do the same thing in the Old Testament context. And what you do there is you... Uh, uh, Decide what kind of literature is this? Is this prophecy? Is it poetry? Is it historical? Etc. And then you do the same thing as you did up here. Get a good outline of your book. Now, if you're in a huge book like Isaiah, then if you're in if you're in like I mean, let's say Isaiah 54, it's a possible one of the papers there is on Isaiah 54. Then just do the outline of uh, 40 to 66. And what you're trying to do is say, okay, how does chapter 54 fit into that topical outline? And, um, and then what you want to do is how do the paragraphs, again, how do those paragraphs uh, uh, relate to the paragraph in Isaiah 54 in which your quotation is found? Of course, in Isaiah 54, it's the first paragraph. Um, Isaiah 54, 1. So, um, then, and by the way, how do you know what paragraphs are? Well, your uh, English text will give you paragraphs, either by a paragraph begins with a bold font or an indentation or something like that. Okay? Um, so, then what you want to do here that you didn't do up here is you want to look at the paragraph. How does the verse that's quoted relate to that paragraph? How is it thematically and logically related? Just do the best you can on that. Now, as I said, uh, before you write your papers, um, and I'll show this to you here. You'll notice on this menu, you see that right there, Old Testament and New Testament project template. Okay. Um, that is a pretty detailed way that you're to write your paper. Let me show you what that looks like here. Now this is from, I used this in the spring, so don't worry about the different date. So here, I go through and 
talk about how to identify everything. I'm just summarizing this for you right now, but this is a bigger summary. And then my handbook is a bigger summary. All right? So, um, and then the actual format of your paper will follow the bare outline to be used for the paper. So you can see the bare outline here. Uh, it's just giving you the main, you know, identify the Old Testament, describe the quotation, uh, describe it. So I just give you the main headings, and then uh, all of these A, B, C's, and D's uh, are described for you in the larger fleshed out outline that we just looked at. Okay. I'm just trying to give you as much help as possible. Okay, let's get back to this then. So what you, what you want to try to do right here is find out where's the main point in the paragraph in which your quotation occurs in the Old Testament. Where's the main point and how does it relate to the quotation? Is the quotation the main point? So it's that sort of thing. When it, Fourthly, survey the use of the Old Testament early and late Judaism that might be of relevance to the New Testament appropriation of the Old Testament text. Uh, and that's what we're going to do tomorrow night. I'm going to go through, give you a library tour, and, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about toward the end of the course, you know, whether you need to do that section or not. It, it's the kind of thing that the research would have to be done here uh, with our library. So... Um, um, and I'm, I'm, ass I'm assuming that, uh, yeah, never mind. Okay. Um, now, now, some people wonder, why are we looking at Judaism here? Why, why, why is it important? Because uh, Judaism often will also quote or allude and thus interpret the same Old Testament quotation that, let's say, for example, Paul is, uh, is citing. And so, why would, why would we want to look at Judaism? Because there's some scholars who would say, well, Judaism is, um, they're not canonical. They're not inspired. Why, why look at them? Um, and, well, the reason is, is that uh, I'm sure all of you had the experience of using English commentaries on the Old or on the New Testament. And I'm sure at some point you read a section of a commentary and you went, oh, my gosh, I've never seen that. That's, that's amazing. That's, I, I, I'd never seen that. You know, and you just know, you, you, you now, by looking at the text, say, yeah, I see that now. I'd never seen it before. All right? And so you're, you're not believing it because um, R.T. France or Peter O'Brien or Don Carson are inerrant in their interpretation. <laughs> They're just commentators. But what they've suggested, you really can see is in the text. Okay? Now, there's some commentaries you read on a text, and you say, well, that's off the wall. That's, that's terrible. Okay, so, so some commentaries are bad, some are good. It's the same in Judaism, but we're pushing back the commentary literature by 2,000 years. Now, that's amazing because there's probably some oral tradition from Old Testament times itself, interpretative oral tradition of the written Hebrew Old Testament that was in existence, and by now, after 2,000 years, it's certainly dissipated. And so they may really have some very good interpretations of, of Old Testament text. Uh, sometimes they're bad, just like modern commentaries, but sometimes they can provide an interpretation that can give you an insight into what Paul is doing. Okay. Um, now sometimes it's also important when they're totally different from what Paul is doing. Why would that be? Because it shows how unique Christianity is in its environment as well. So, and sometimes you look at a Jewish use, you'll say, I have no idea how that relates to the New Testament, so you just leave that alone. You don't know. Um, okay, so um, so that's uh, Judaism. Uh, here we compare the texts, uh, and we'll be we'll be doing that at various points. Uh, a good example of comparing the text is given in that last chapter of the book, where I compare the text of uh, Revelation uh, three seven with Isaiah twenty two twenty two, and so you you get a chart 
and you put columns down and at the top you put Hebrew, uh, LXX, which is Greek, um, the um, New Testament, and uh, the Targum. Now the Targum is a Aramaic translation and you'll only be doing that in English. Okay? And what you'll do, you put all of the text side by side in, in like four columns, and then you'll underline the differences. And by doing that, and you'll see how I underline them in that last chapter. You can use that as a model. Now, there, there's also a section uh, in, the te uh, in comparing the text uh, in my chapter on this. I have a chapter on, with these steps here, and you can use that as well as a model of how to underline. But by doing that, what you do is you can tell, okay, is the author more in line with the Greek Old Testament or the Hebrew Old Testament? Okay? And if so, if more in line with the Greek, why? Now, sometimes you may not be able to answer that question. Sometimes you might. Okay? All right. Um, so this is just the manual labor of composing the chart. This is actually analyzing why. Okay? And then seven. Analyze the author's interpretative hermeneutical use of the Old Testament. That's what I've asked you to do beginning less section, uh, lecture four, okay? And um, so uh, you'll, you'll be working on the hermeneutical use, the interpretative use of the Old Testament. And in a moment, I'm going to show you 12 hermeneutical or interpretative uses in just one second, well, a few seconds. And, um, and so the rest of the lecture today, in fact, and in early in the morning, is going to unpack all this. And it's one of those 12 that you're going to choose from. You know, when you look at my lecture topics, you know, when you're writing that paragraph to turn in, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to choose um, one of those. Okay? Now, there may be more uses, but these are the ones that, that I found are most predominant and certainly will be uses uh, that apply to the passages I'll be dealing with. So, you already have the uses. You don't have to figure it out, but you've got to decide which one is used here. Okay? And this is going to be the lion, this is going to be the most important part of the paper here. Uh, the other important part of the paper is section three, uh, approach three, which is the Old Testament context. That's huge. And you'll find me spending a lot of time in the Old Testament context in some of my lectures. It's because it's exceedingly important. Because the context, I find, is often key to the use of the old and the new. Analyze the author's theological use of the Old Testament. Now here, what you would do, uh, this is in two parts actually. First, just get a good systematic theology textbook. You know, Burkhoff or Turretin or um, um, who's the other one we read here? Bob Inc. Thank you. Don't tell him I'm, I, I couldn't think of Bob Inc. Okay. Um, Bob Inc. Okay. Bob Inc., Turretin, Burkhoff, those would be good standard ones. And just look at the table of contents, the theological topics, and bombard your passage. Hmm, is this about, oh, how about Christology? Maybe the New Testament writer is taking a text about Yahweh that is applied to Jesus. Jesus may be applying it to himself, or Paul may be applying it to Jesus. Uh, it's great when a Jehovah's Witness comes to the door. You know, this, you, know get, you get some of those texts, and, well, how can this be applied to, to Jesus if he's not equal to Yahweh, you know? So, um, so that's what you do, all right? Uh, that would be a Christological use of the Old Testament. Or it may be a text that Paul is using. Um, and, uh, for example, um, Exodus 19.6. It's found in Revelation 1.6 and 5.10 and 1 Peter chapter 2, where it says, you are a kingdom of priests. Um, well, that's applied to the church, not to Israel anymore. So that's a statement about what topic? Ecclesiology. ecclesiology. So you look down the topics, you find ecclesiology. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. But the second part of this is what theological presuppositions underlie the author's hermeneutical use of the Old Testament. Now, we're going to have to wait on that. I'm going to give you five presuppositions. And you can choose from one or two or more of those, okay, that are undergirding the author's theological use of the Old Testament. For example, why would 
John in the book of Revelation twice apply Exodus 19.6 to the church, to Gentiles predominantly and then some Jews, of course. Why would he do that? Well, one of the presuppositions I believe that the New Testament writers had when they interpreted the Old Testament was that Jesus was true Israel and that all those who identify with him are true Israel. Those are actually two presuppositions. Uh, that were identified with him as corporate representation. That's a presupposition. That's, and by the way, all these presuppositions are found in the Old Testament. These are not new presuppositions. There's some uh, scholars who say, oh, the New Testament writers are reading in their own presuppositions. Remember I talked about that with postmodernism? Yeah, they sure are, but not their own presuppositions. All their presuppositions are coming out of the Old Testament. Yeah, but where did they get those presuppositions from? Exactly. exactly. They, didn't just, they just didn't create them. Exactly, exactly. And so, um, corporate representation is, is, is massive. I mean, just think about Adam and all those who are corporately represented in him. But it, it extends to fathers. Uh, fathers represent families. Kings represent uh, their people. And, and prophets often will represent their people. So, um, so that, that what the, uh, if the king gets blessed, people get blessed. If he gets cursed, the king gets cursed. And uh, so what, what is true about the king is true about the people. And so what's true about King Jesus is true about us. So if, if he's true Israel, then that probably underlies the notion of why uh, John would apply a text about Israel from Exodus 19.6 to the church. It's, it's kind of the link that's missing. It's right underneath, you see. It's right underneath. And um, so that would be the second part here. Uh, uh, of theological use. Analyze the author's rhetorical use of the Old Testament. All this is is what we might call the pastoral use. But what you want to find first is how is Paul, for example, using Isaiah 54.1 in uh, Galatians 4 to motivate the readers to believe something or do something or both? In other words, rhetoric is moving. That's what you want to do when you preach, right? Now, in the ancient world, they had all kinds of tricks to move people. I mean, all kinds of tricks. And it still continues today. There was a, a speech teacher at a college, in fact, it's in Pennsylvania, I won't tell you where, but, um, and he was a Christian uh, and a preacher. And he taught that there were nine buttons to push to move your people. One was to cry. Another is the introduction. You know, get, well, you know do some joke that has nothing to do with the sermon. You can warm the people up and that gets them on your side. Another is, you know, our experiences are limited. And so think up something that is an event that could have happened in your life, or maybe it happened to someone else, that's a good illustration of this passage you're preaching on, and act like it happened to you. It's amazing. But that is straight out of the ancient world. And this is what Paul is reacting against, for example, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, in the second Corinthians, see, I don't speak very well. Remember when he says that? Well, that's because they were professional speakers. And that doesn't mean he was a bad preacher. What it means, he didn't use the button approach that they used to control people. So that's what you want to find out. Now, sometimes in the Gospels, this may be harder. This may be hard. It's hard to know, you know, because we don't know as much about the audience and the problem. The more you know about the problem and the occasion and the people, then the more you'll be able to answer this number nine. And then uh, uh, part of that then is your own, how, 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 are, how is this text going to move your people to right belief and right action? So that's, that's the launching pad of that last one. Okay. So, so we could call this a homiletics class. All right. All right. So that's the ninefold, that's the outline of your paper. Okay. So we're already the outline of your paper. Now, um, I, I, I would ask you if you had any questions about that, but we're so early in the course. But, you know, uh, in, in, any questions on that, on, on, on that approach? We're going to be elaborating on that throughout the whole course. So, but if you had some kind of question, I'd be happy to field it. Okay. All right. Um, now. now what we want to look at is this. 
And again, I'm not handing this out to you because uh, you, uh, you have this on the online site, okay? It's stated right there on the first page, right by uh, uh, the uh, interpretative approach, ninefold. Primary ways New Testament uses the Old Testament. Now, all we're doing here with this is fleshing out step seven that we just looked at. And we're going to do that the rest of the day and even on in tomorrow. These are the different ways the Old Testament is used in the New. And this is, I'm, I'm going to go through each of these and give illustrations so that you can see how to do your homework and eventually with a view to uh, uh, doing a good job on this step in your paper. Okay? All right. So... Number one, to indicate, to indicate direct fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Okay? This is the easiest one. It's the easiest one. And by the way, just as the ninefold approach I, I give to you on pages 41 to 54, this is all blown up uh, for you uh, in chapter 4 called Primary Ways the New Testament Uses the Old Testament, pages 55 to 95, because it takes a while to do that, because I want to give illustrations. Okay? So, um, let's look at some examples of this. It's the easiest one. It's when a prophet makes a prediction and the New Testament writer sees it as fulfilled. It's the, it's the easiest, it's how most people, when they first become Christians, think of prophecy, even perhaps unbelievers may think of it that way. And so let me give you some illustrations of that, for example, uh, if you, and by the way, you do need, how, how many of you uh, have your English Bibles? Does everybody have an English hard copy Bible? Because if you don't, you need to get one from the library. You need a hard copy Bible, okay? Uh, I think it's just a little bit too difficult to maneuver on the computer because we're going to be doing a lot of looking at passages. So you need your English, you need your English text. So Matthew chapter 2 and verse 5. So we're mainly going to be fleshing these uses out with the uh, New Testament text. Matthew 2, 5, And they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. Well, it's in verse 4, Herod said, Where is the Christ to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, verse 5 says. And then verse 6 says, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And in the context, Jesus uh, is about to be born. And so that... that, that that's about to be fulfilled. It's not technically fulfilled, but it's about to be fulfilled. Um, and uh, in fact, um, in, in, in the context, um, it has been fulfilled. Chapter 2, verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. So it has been fulfilled recently. So when he quotes that in verse 6, it's clearly, even though it's spoken of um, in the future tense as it was in Micah um, chapter 5, it's clearly seen as a fulfillment. Um, but even more clearly, uh, chapter 3 and verse 3. Uh, speaking of John the Baptist, for this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And uh, this, this is applied to John the Baptist. He is the fulfillment of the one crying in the wilderness. Prophecy, fulfillment. Um, likewise, if you look at... Um, uh, Luke chapter 4 and verse 17. Luke 4, 17. Jesus is in 
Nazareth. He's at the synagogue on the Sabbath. And uh, verse 16 says, He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now he's quoting Isaiah 61. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began saying to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, um, it's not completely fulfilled because it's an already and not yet. He's in the process of fulfilling that throughout his ministry. But it has begun fulfillment. Usually most fulfillment in the New Testament is already and not yet. It's inaugurated and is going to be consummated when Jesus returns a final time. But he's beginning to fulfill that prophecy. This is the most straightforward kind of of the use of the Old Testament and the New that you can find. Now, even though sometimes uh, these straightforward uses of, of fulfillment uh, of prophecy are uh, the simplest to recognize, they're not always easy to interpret. And in a minute, I'm going to show you that. Yeah. Just going back to that uh, John the Baptist one and interacting with a little bit of Francis work there, it's, is there some typological overlap in that too? Or is it just straight prediction? where there was another you know, representative of one coming in the wilderness. Um, um, and, and even a bigger question, yeah. I guess I would say, is even if it's not that particular one, yeah. because typology always has that forward look, like right. you just said, right. is, you know, I would find myself being a little bit confused. Okay. My next step is to look at number two. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. So hold your question. And ask me more there, mm -hmm. uh, because I may not answer your question as I explain that. Um, and, and how did France say that that was uh, typological? Do you remember? I'm well, not saying he said that. Was oh, oh, okay. I'm just saying okay. that, those, that yeah. category he introduced to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's. Um, he's very good on typology. Let's uh, let's let's go in a moment to number two. But let me finish. Uh, uh, e even though the, uh, uh, this uh, direct fulfillment of uh, direct Old Testament verbal prophecy is pretty straightforward, as I say, sometimes it's not so straightforward how to interpret it. For example, look at Matthew 8 with me, Matthew chapter 8. And we're just going to go on until our break, okay? Sorry, if you need to use the facilities, feel free to go on or um, use them right after class. Um, in, in chapter 8, in, in uh, verse 14, uh, Jesus has healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then verse 16, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, cast out the spirits of the word, and healed all who were ill. In order that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, He took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Now, that, that is from Isaiah 53.4, uh, a prophecy uh, of the suffering servant um, who, who would come to die for the sin of the people. Now, um, the problem with this is this text isn't applied to Jesus' substitutionary death for his people, which is the way most people understand this passage in Isaiah 53. This is seen, healing people miraculously is seen as a fulfillment of this passage. So it, it, it's difficult. Um, it clearly is a straightforward fulfillment. Yeah, the miracles are, uh, the miraculous healings are fulfilling this prophecy. But usually the way we interpret that is this, this idea of carrying away our sins. He took our infirmities. He suffered in our place. But now we have this. How, how, any ideas on what we make of this? Um, 
since, again, most, most evangelicals take this as a spiritual healing, not physical healing. Um, any? Well, Francis, when he was talking about how a lot of times an expression of typology, you say typology, is that the way that we're saying it? Yeah, that's the right way to say it, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. And at other times, it's being seen as fulfillment in the church as Israel. And I wonder if there's mm -hmm. kind of a, a double meaning here, mm -hmm. where this is this he's particularly interpreting it through the lens of the church mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. people. I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have to think more about that. Um, certainly. Yeah. Go on. I think so. A foretaste of, I mean, ultimately, he's going to be all of our diseases, and he comes as a witness to that initially. Yeah. I mean, I think evangelicals tend to read that kind of Protestant theology into everything. We're so quick to get there, but yeah. instead of going there, you know, first, yeah. like, why not? I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, Certainly, this is inaugurated, and yet uh, he's going to come and take the people's sin upon himself on the cross. But uh, on the other hand, his healings certainly are a foreshadowing of his own resurrection. And certainly, if you asked Isaiah, in my opinion, are people just going to be uh, spiritually in existence in eternity? Uh, they'll be, uh, their spiritual sin will be forgiven, but where are their bodies going to be? No, I think that, that, that full healing is not just spiritual, it's also, it's also physical. And I think that's what he has in mind here. This is an adumbration, not just of, foreshadowing, not just of his physical resurrection, but also of the spiritual healing of those to whom he'll minister to, and ultimately, consummately, the physical healing. I sometimes ask, yeah. That's that peripheral thing you're talking about. I think so. I th yeah, the, uh, that's kind of peripheral theological vision at that point. Um, but, but Isaiah elsewhere, when it talks about the idea of the new creation, he, he talks about miracles. I mean, it may be peripheral vision to Isaiah itself. It's very interesting that you say that. For example, in Isaiah 35, um, this is the time of restoration new creation. He says in verse 4, God will save you. Now listen to what he says. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy. And that's part of what's happening here. He is healing not just the demon-possessed, but uh, clearly he is healing, as, as the broader context of the gospel tells us, the lame and uh, others as well. So, um, yeah, I think so. And I, you know, I, ask, I sometimes ask people, um, what... Uh, Why is it necessary? You know, Paul is so, he's absorbed in 1 Corinthians 15 that there's got to be a final resurrection of the body. He says, if there's not a final resurrection of all saints, not even Christ has been raised. Well, what's the argument there? Well, he says a little later, Christ is the first fruits. When he rises, we're so corporately identified with him, it's going to spur our, our rise as well. We will be raised. And that's why. If there's not a physical resurrection of the saints, then Paul can say, well, not even Christ has been raised, if there's not. And um, it's interesting that there is a, uh, even within Reformed Presbyterian circles, intriguingly, and, and elsewhere, there is a, a notion of what's called preterism. I don't know if many of you have run across preterism. Now, preterism argues, it's an eschatological view that says that uh, the fulfillment of the resurrection of all the promises of God of the new creation was in 70 A.D. That's, that's one main version. And that it was figuratively fulfilled. So there will be no physical resurrection of the saints. They do hold a resurrection of Christ, but not of the saints. That all saints will only be spiritually saved. It's very interesting. I, in fact, uh, I went down to a, um, a conference, a small conference, uh, down in Florida. R.C. Sproul organized it, and we, 
we met with a guy who had written a number of books on this, and, uh, and a number of theologians came together and discussed this with him. And one of the things that, that uh, we concluded was, and tried to impress upon him, was that um, if there's no physical resurrection of the dead at the end of time, then the full curses of Adam's sin have not been reversed. Because it's not just spiritual, it's also physical. So Paul actually sees this part of the gospel. It's amazing. I read some on this too, that extends from the resurrection body of God to even creation, all of creation. When you think of uh, Peter when he talks about um, the earth will be consumed by fire, there's some different interpretations of that text that say that's not a destruction of the world in totality, but rather is, is in a lot of different views, but that so that it would be a purging and a, a resurrecting, so to speak, of the original creation as it was intended to be. Mm. Which is interesting when you think about, you know, God created this world yeah. and, and he created our bodies uh, for a particular purpose. Why why would it not be have been a good purpose that can be resurrected in a, in a different yeah. form, you know? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. His, for his purpose and plan. Yeah. Romans 8 actually puts the two together, that creation groans along with us and waits the revealing of the sons of God and resurrection, and then it'll be renewed. So there is that, there, there's that, 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 definite, uh, that definite connection. So, I, so, so that's a straightforward you know, fulfillment use, but on the, at first glance, it's kind of hard to say, well, what is he saying? How is he interpreting Isaiah there? I think he's interpreting it consummately at that point. Uh, and, and yet saying that's begun, physical healing's begun, but those people are going to die again. So it's a foreshadowing of his resurrection and then of the resurrection of the saints. So I, I believe in the health and wealth gospel. I just don't believe, uh, I, I think it's over-realized eschatology, uh, a lot of the health and wealth gospel. All right, um, well, those are some illustrations. Let's look at the second one, uh, one that's been mentioned by a couple of you, to indicate fulfillment of Old Testament typological prophecy. Let's just look at some examples here. One of the examples I, I usually go to is Hosea 2, 14 to 15, but we're going to look at that later in the course. Um, so I'm going to save that for now, but I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to John 13, 18. John 13, 18. We're at the uh, Last Supper, and... Jesus says in verse 17 about his disciples, John 13, 17, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I've chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now, this comes from Psalm 41 and verse 9. And it's, it's not a direct prophecy. It's a narrative David is reflecting on uh, his trusted counselor, Ahithophel, and his friend who betrayed him. And so what's going on here? How can you use the language of fulfillment? And this is why a lot of people would say the New Testament writers play fast and loose. Here's a, yes, a psalm, a historical reflection in a psalm that's made into a prophecy. It's fulfilled. Weird. Um, but what I'm going to contend is that there's a philosophy of history in which God has designed earlier events to be similar to later events. In fact, He does that so much, He makes them so similar that the earlier events are not only similar, but point forward to the later similar events events. And I believe that this is a, uh, a presupposition. It's one of the presuppositions, by the way, as we'll see in a moment. But uh, this is a presupposition. And, uh, uh, and they got it from the Old Testament. You'll see it in the Old Testament. There's a lot, a lot of the uh, new work in, in, in Old Testament studies today is being done on the use of the old and the old. And, and some of those uses are typological. It's very interesting. And we'll, we'll look at some of those, in fact. 
in this class. Um, so, uh, so he sees that that historical event is a foreshadowing. The pattern of betrayal between a friend and another uh, is foreshadowing what happened between uh, Jesus and Judas. Um, and that's why Jesus uses fulfill. By the way, if this is a fast and loose method, and it's just not quite right, if you will, it's Jesus who's using it too. This is not just that the apostles were wrong. We, we move ourselves into not just an inspiration problem at that point, dealing with Paul or Peter, but we move ourselves into a, Christo, uh, a Christology problem. And that's why a lot of people say that this was not the actual word. Statements like this would not be the actual words of Jesus, but statements coming from the early church. Yeah, right. maybe. Yep, that certainly occurs, especially in the upper room discourse, uh, which we're, we're in now. Especially the prayer. Some would say, well, that's, a lot of that's not from Jesus, and so forth and so on. I, I know an acquaintance of mine does a dissertation on, on, the, on, the, on that prayer, I guess John 17. Yeah. Okay, let's look at another example. And we don't have to go far. Go to John 19.36. This occurs throughout all the Gospels. I'm just kind of scraping the typological cream off the biblical cake here. <laughs> Chapter 19 and verse 36. And uh, notice uh, this is talking about Jesus at the cross. And... Um, We find another recollection of the psalm. Look at verse 24. He's at the cross. They said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide where, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. They divided my outer garments among them, and as for my, and for my clothing they cast lots. Well, that's from Psalm 22, and it probably is in a section. David's recollecting his own sufferings in some way, or the psalmist probably, I think, is David. These are, these are describing his sufferings. And yet Matthew says it's fulfilled. So what you have is the sufferings of David pointing forward to Christ. So what we're really saying here is that these two are virtually the same. This is verbal prophecy, and we might call this event prophecy. Events have such a foreshadowing nature sometimes that they point forward. So you can see... We've seen the, the first category that uses this as the fulfillment of that. And these use the language of fulfillment. But you don't always have to have the language of fulfillment, either with category one or two. You can tell by going back to the Old Testament and how it's being used in the New in the context that that's going on. You don't always need, if you will, the uh, 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 actual language of fulfillment. Um, let's keep going, though. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. That's from Psalm 69, 21, another uh, uh, narrative about probably David's suffering. Again, fulfillment. But probably the hardest here is in verse 36. You remember that the soldiers uh, um, came and verse 32, they broke the legs of the first man or the other man who was crucified with him, making sure they were dead. But coming to Jesus when they saw he was, uh, or I guess it was to make, you know, to speed on their death. But coming to Jesus when they saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately there came out blood and water. Verse 36, for these things came to pass that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another says, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. Now that phrase, not a bone of him shall be broken, at least is from Exodus 12, 46 and Numbers 9, 12. I discussed this in the book. There may be another passage uh, uh, that, that may be included here. I'm not going to talk about that now. But um, in uh, Exodus 12, 
and Numbers 9. This is just an ordinance about the Passover lamb. This is what you're to do now and in following generations. Not a bone of him shall be broken. How in the world could just such an ordinance repeated throughout Israel become a prophecy? Because it says, for these things came to pass, the scripture might be fulfilled. Again, I think we have to see that the, uh, that, that, that action that, that was repeated was a pointer to an ultimate lamb who would be slain. Um, now, often what you can find, let, let me just say, in a minute we're going to go to analogy. Okay? An analogy is... Uh, where you don't have the language of fulfillment. And the author's not using it in, in either of these ways. He's just saying this is like that. It has nothing to do with prophecy. But sometimes you will have uh, an event from the Old Testament that's, that's alluded to by a New Testament writer. And it's more than analogical. Uh, because typology, remember, has similarity. It has analogy in it. So it's more than analogical, and uh, sometimes it's typological, even though it won't have the language of fulfillment. And how would you know? Well, often if you go back into the immediate Old Testament context, you'll see indications that the, auth the Old Testament author himself saw that event as something that was pointing forward. We're going to look at that. I'm going to give you some cases of that. But that's one of the ways that uh, we know something is typological by seeing that there are indications in the Old Testament itself that that event was seen by the Old Testament author himself as something pointing forward. And, uh, uh, and there are some other ways uh, to detect that in the Old Testament. Likewise, in the New Testament, uh, something may be more than just analogical if the context indicates that uh, the New Testament writer is seeing it as typological. For example, maybe, you know, he might state a, an allusion to the Old Testament and two verses later he says, um, uh, these things were necessary. Uh, or maybe uh, it's about, um, in one particular passage we're going to look at, look at, it's about the house of David. And that's all. But everywhere else in the New Testament, house of David is part of prophetic fulfillment. It's always associated with prophetic fulfillment in regard to Jesus. So part of it will be doing a word study in the New Testament uh, on some of the words around your allusion. And often they're charged with what I call prophetic or typological electricity, if you will. Okay. So um, one last one uh, is in Acts chapter 1. Ooh, we better... Uh, this will be the last one because we've got we've to go. Acts chapter 1, 20 to 21. Um, you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up on this. Just one last illustration, then we'll move on to number three, but we need to uh, get over to the, um, let's see, is, is, it, is it the... Uh, carriage house where the dinners are? Yeah. So we better, we better go over there because I think our dinner is waiting there now. <laughs> Sorry about that. We don't want to get back. No, no. So we'll, uh, we'll resume back here. Why don't we say five, give us full hour five after six. You good to keep things in here? Everything can stay in here. I'm leaving mine. So hopefully that's going to be safe. Okay, looks like it's a little bit past five after, so get back on the road here. I wanted to give you one last uh, uh, passage supporting a typological use. It was in Acts chapter 1. Perhaps you're still open there. And um, <clears throat> this is uh, at the occasion when they have to fill Judas's place and, and get another disciple. And uh, in verse 16, chapter 1. Peter says, um, 
brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his portion in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. It's, not, uh, it's hard to read after dinner, but... <laughs> And became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language that field was called Hakeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his homestead be made desolate, let no man dwell in it, and his office let another man take. Now, that is from uh, the first uh, references from Psalm 69.25, the second from uh, Psalm 109.8, I believe. But uh, remember, we already had one from Psalm 69 applied to Jesus. Now we have uh, his, uh, the persecutors of the psalmist foreshadow Judas, uh, Judas himself. So it's quite interesting that uh, sort of the dark side of uh, being a traitor finds so much in the uh, 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 prophetic uh, perspective of the New Testament that this also was something that was prophesied and foreshadowed, the, the um, betraying of, of the Messiah, um, so that it was determined. Now, um, so that, that we're, we're going uh, pr tomorrow at some point have a fuller lecture on typology. I just wanted to introduce some of the basics of typology for you. Um, we, we can call this, um, we call it indirect fulfillment instead of direct, in the sense that it is um, an event prophecy and not a prophecy by direct words. So we'll call that in, uh, indirect fulfillment of Old Testament typological prophecy. Uh, we'll even look at a word study on tupos, from which we get the, um, the word uh, type and, and, and is the basis for typological. And we'll, we'll even see that that word was chosen because etymologically within the word itself, it has to do with something that is designed beyond itself. So we'll, we'll see that. But it's a, an appropriate choice of the word for this, this sort of thing. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll come back to typology and, and go into more depth. The third kind of use is uh, to indicate affirmation that are not yet fulfilled uh, uh, Old Testament prophecy will assuredly be fulfilled in the future. So what we're saying here is a writer comes to something, he quotes an Old Testament prophecy and says, this hasn't yet been fulfilled. Now, of course, I was just talking at dinner about, well, every prophecy has been fulfilled. Uh, so maybe I should be more precise. Uh, this is a not yet fulfilled Old Testament prophecy in consummation. All right. And, and sometimes New Testament writers want to underscore this. I'll give you one example if you turn to 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3. In 2 Peter 3, remember the famous statement of the Lord's not slow about His promise. In verse 9, some count slowness. He says, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. And then verse 13, But according to His promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, that is an allusion to Isaiah 65, 17 and 66, 22. He alludes to them both. We were just talking about that at dinner too. And, um, and, but he's underscoring here that though the new heavens and earth certainly uh, uh, in in in, in the New Testament perspective, has begun to be fulfilled. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, if anyone is in Christ, old, uh, uh, he's a new creation, old things passed away, behold, new things have come. And so, and there it's talking about a person identified with Christ's death and especially resurrection. So th those who are identified with his resurrection and are true believers, then they are part of this new creation. Um, but that's not what, what's emphasized. Here what's emphasized is the consummation of that new creation has not yet come. We are still looking for it. So, um, 
that would be a, a good a, a good case of that. Um, now, let's go to number four to indicate uh, an. It should be an there to indicate an analogical or illustrative use of the Old Testament. This is used quite a bit. By the way, all of these, uh, one, two, and three, are used quite a bit. They probably make up the majority of uh, uses of the old and the new. So, let's talk about that. Um, the analogical use uh, is to illustrate or draw an analogy to emphasize what we might call some gnomic principle. That is a principle that abides, that uh, continues from the old on into the New Testament. So, uh, it usually, we can say it this way, it expresses principles of continuity. That, that's why you have a uh, an event from the Old Testament that's carried over to the New. Um, it is to express some kind of continuity, and that's what the author's wanting to draw. You, and you, Every time you've got to go back to the Old Testament uh, context to see, okay, what's the idea here? And then you pull that over into the New Testament. Uh, so a word or phrase from the Old comes to stand for or to be applied to something in the New. Now, uh, what if, could you have a statement from a prophecy? For example, let's take uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, new things have come. It's very clear. Everybody acknowledges that's from Isaiah 65 and verse 17. But there's no fulfillment formula there. So could, could, could that be just used analogically? If you go back to the context, it talks about a new heavens and earth. And could Paul be saying there, well, this is also, uh, you know, when a person becomes a believer, they become like a new creation. They're not really the new creation, but they're like it. Could, it, could this just be analogical? My answer to that is probably not. Whenever you find allusions or quotations to Old Testament prophecies in the New, you're not going to have an analogical use. And the reason is, is because of the context. If it's prophetic in the Old, it's probably being used in some prophetic way here in the New. And even if it's an allusion. And so the context will tell you. And so this is why I would say that, that Paul, in fact, I've, I've demonstrated, uh, uh, um, I think I even have this, yeah, it's, it's an article that's, that's in the right doctrine from wrong text that I've written on the Old Testament background of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5 to 7. And I, I, I set up a textual comparison chart and show that the language of uh, uh, Isaiah 65, 17, together with 2 Corinthians 5, 17, on, on new and behold and uh, what's another and I think creation. Anyway, there, there are three or four words that are found there that are only found there and in Isaiah 65, 17. So it's clearly an illusion. And um, uh, could it be analogical, though? Well, I don't think so because I think it's a prophetic context. And, um, and Paul will continue. Uh, we'll, we'll see why a little bit later, even this evening or in the morning, how he uses more allusions and quotations after 517. And they all come from prophetic restoration of Israel context all the way up to chapter 7 and verse 3. And so that's probably what's in mind because the new creation prophecies of Isaiah 65 and uh, 66 are actually part of restoration of Israel context. When there's going to be a final eschatological restoration, there's going to be a new heavens and earth. Um, so the point here is just to, you'll know if you have an, uh, an allusion or a quotation to a prophetic text but it doesn't use fulfillment language, probably it's still uh, being inaugurated or the author's doing what Peter was doing, looking at something yet future. It's not likely going to be analogical. When you have an analogy 
you'll have references to historical events, to institutions, um, and so on. Priests, lambs, actions, certain historical things. Okay? So th hopefully that, that, that'll help you uh, when you're trying to decide if something's analogical or not. Okay, Pasher, uh, there are a lot of people, um, how can I put this, there was a real emphasis uh, a number of years ago on trying to understand the New Testament in parallel with Qumran. Qumran has, has uh, especially in the Habakkuk scroll, for example, uh, it's a commentary in Habakkuk, and it, it will uh, describe something that, that happened in, in, in the history of, of the Qumran community. Um, and uh, maybe it'll say, and this was about the wicked, and, and the wicked priest did this in, in, in Jerusalem. And then it'll say, uh, um, I, mean, I need to turn that around. Um, let's see. Yeah, he'll quote a text from Habakkuk. Okay, then he'll use this formula, Pishro Al, the interpretation of it concerns, and then he'll state this uh, historical incident about the wicked priest or something like that. So he'll always state a commentary verse from Habakkuk, and then he'll give that that formula, the interpretation of it, Pishro Al. So there is an overlap because they actually saw uh, some of this from Habakkuk being prophetically fulfilled in. Uh, uh, in, in their midst. And the New Testament does the same thing. Uh, and even quotes Habakkuk. Paul loves Habakkuk and uh, Hebrews quotes it in uh, especially chapter 2. Uh, the righteous will live by faith. Or the righteous one. Um, so, yeah, there's a general overlap. And that, that's what makes Qumran unique. I mean, Qumran also believed that they were in the inaugurated latter days. That happened nowhere else in Judaism. That was amazing. Yeah, it was really amazing. Uh, if anybody came close to a Messiah, he wasn't, but if anyone came close, it was the so-called teacher of righteousness who was sort of the interpreter of these prophecies and probably wrote some of these uh, commentaries in the Qumran, some of the Qumran works. Um, so, yeah, there's a general... Uh, um, uh, kind of, of, of similarity. Um, what is different, of course, is that, that Christ is not the center of the Qumran community. And they, they saw the consummation of the latter days coming at some point, probably within their lifetimes. And, uh, and all, the, all these prophecies that they thought would, they, they considered themselves to be the, the, the elect remnant of Israel. And, uh, uh, but the prophecies they made about themselves just didn't happen. And uh, they did happen, in my view, in the New Testament community. So, uh, but there are a lot of similarities. But I, I, I would rather just use the language of fulfillment than, um, than, than, than Pesher. Um, but you do have the phrase, you know, occasionally you'll find um, Peter and others saying, this is that. You know, for example, in... Um, one example of that that people have compared to Qumran is Acts chapter 2 um, in verse 16 where they're speaking in tongues. Peter says, this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. That comes pretty close. But that's just classic, I think, as we'll see, classic, uh, classic fulfillment. Um, so let's look at a few illustrations of uh, an analogical use of Scripture. Um, uh, if you look with me at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. What I'm trying to do is flesh out these uses with some scriptural examples. Chapter 2 and verse uh, 19. He's speaking to the church at Thyatira. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds are greater than at first. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who is called a prophetess. And she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So Jezebel, does he just come up with that name? Um, it's either uh, an individual woman uh, leading others astray or it's um, a name 
uh, for a corporate group of false teachers, I, probably a, an individual woman. Uh, this would be an analogical use of Scripture. You go back to Jezebel in, 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 in the narratives of kings. And uh, what did she do? Jezebel was a Canaanite wife of King Ahab. And so uh, uh, she helped establish and cause to flourish uh, Baal worship in Israel. And um, so she did the best she could to influence the king and Israel to worship idols. And, and that's just the topic here. Notice, she calls herself a prophetess in verse 20, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And uh, so probably she is someone from outside the covenant community, as was Jezebel, who comes in, establishes herself, and then does her best to cause the believers to compromise with idols. So if you want to find out more about Jezebel here, go back to the Old Testament descriptions of Jezebel. She also reached a pretty bad end, as you may remember. And so it will be, look at verse 22. Behold, I'll cast her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. Um, I say she probably comes from outside the covenant community here. Why would I say that? Well, in chapter 17, there are about, 12 different ways that John describes Babylon the Great. And all of those 12 different ways are sketches from kings about Jezebel. And um, uh, it even says uh, they will eat her flesh in chapter 17. Well, that's just right out of kings. And, and so there, there are a number of uh, um, parallels. Uh, and, and Babylon is, is a pagan reality. And so uh, she's coming from the world into the covenant community. In fact, Babylon would be a good example if you turn to chapter 17, another example of an analogical use of the Old Testament. Chapter 17, and um, verse 1, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. Those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine, of her immorality. And, uh, and, and then we get uh, further description, verse 4, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations of the unclean things of her immorality. And upon her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So, and she's repeatedly called Babylon, and we repeatedly get references to Babylon chapter 14 uh, on up through 18. And so, um, so what is this? Um, well, go back to the Old Testament, you find out about Babylon. Babylon was the place of the covenant community's exile. And it was there where they were tempted to worship idols, and they were tempted to compromise, and it was there that they were uh, persecuted if they didn't compromise. And so we can carry that over. And now we go from a, a local Babylon the Great to a world system that is Babylon the Great. And um, uh, it's a place of exile for believers. It's a place of persecution and a place of um, where people are tempted to uh, worship idols. So, uh, in, in each case, the Old Testament context is absolutely crucial. And uh, in this particular one, it's not always the case when Babylon uh, is mentioned, but Babylon the Great here comes um, out of uh, Daniel chapter 4. It's the only place where you get Babylon the Great. Nebuchadnezzar says, have I not built Babylon the Great? And um, so, in this particular, m most of the time, you, you would just generally go to, well, what was Babylon about, as I just discussed? In this particular case, it is uh, the context of Daniel 5, um, where Daniel finds himself in exile, and yet uh, he is one who perseveres and um, rises to the top, even announces judgment to the king in Daniel chapter 4, which does occur, and the same thing happens here. Judgment is announced, 
and it will occur too. Um, okay, well those are just a few, that, that's pretty basic, uh, but if you're teaching a Bible study, you're writing a commentary, a paper, or if you're, uh, you're preaching, you want to make sure when you find this, always go uh, uh, back to the Old Testament and it'll usually uh, flesh out the nature of that analogy. Um, and uh, w one thing very important that I want to mention now, uh, and that is, uh, this is the Nesalalan Greek New Testament. And when you're preaching, or teaching a Bible study, most of the time, you don't look at this. That just looks like abbreviated stuff you don't want to look at. Just like when you look down at the text critical apparatus, you don't want to look at that either. Okay? If you're not used to reading it, it's tough. It's a, it's a, it's a learning curve. But this is easier. Whenever you're preaching, always look in the margin. And uh, let's see if we have any here. Uh, see if we have any illusions here. That's pretty small. Um, let's see any right there. Usually you'll find a number of... Excuse me? Oh, yeah, I, I can magnify. Yeah, I, I know how to do that. Yeah. Uh, I think I need to turn to another passage, though. Um, let's see here. Yeah, this is good. Uh, this is from uh, Philippians chapter 2, the famous uh, passage where it says Christ became a servant. Uh, and you'll notice here, if you were preaching on this passage, you certainly would, um, yeah. it's this passage, sorry. You certainly would want to look at um, Isaiah 53, 11. Uh, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Some think that that is an illusion. Isaiah 53, 11. And likewise here, in order that in the name of Jesus, every, uh, every knee should bow. Isaiah 45, 23, that's probably a quotation here, even though it's not set up as a quotation. Um, where are we? Right there. It's probably a quotation from Isaiah 45, 23. That, that's huge, because that's said of Yahweh in, in Isaiah 45. And now, now it's applied to Jesus Christ. So the servant is being identified with, uh, with Yahweh here. So if you want to preach what I call redemptive historically, what does that mean, redemptive history? You want to preach in a way that's sensitive to the redemptive history of Scripture that came before and, and up to your point and maybe what follows. If you're, if you're in the Gospels or if you're in the Old Testament, you want to be sensitive. If you're later in the Old Testament, you want to be sensitive to how earlier Old Testament texts or feeding into your text. If you're uh, later in the Old Testament, um, um, you, 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 you want to be very careful about how that text is used in the New Testament. So you're always wanting to contextualize your text redemptive historically, and this is the way to do it. Uh, really, fun. here's another <laughs> that uh, every knee should bow, that, uh, that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. That's one really applied uh, there to. Uh, Yahweh now applied to Jesus, and it actually begins right here. So um, this is very simple. If you would just legalistically make it a step when you're preparing a sermon or a Bible study, always look at the margins here. And when you're in the Old Testament, do the same thing. You'll find Old Testament parallels, New Testament parallels. Now, Nesalalan says whenever they give an Old Testament reference, but they don't put it in quotation marks, they consider it an illusion. It may be, it may not be. You have to test that out uh, to verify that, quite frankly. I'm not always convinced. Most of the time, I think they're probably right. But uh, you need to look at the verbal uh, parallel and, and the unique thematic similarity. So, um, uh, so, so when, they, when, when they do state these things, um, it's an alert to you to, uh, okay, is this really an illusion? And then you go back and you say, okay, what's... What's the Old Testament context? And that, that will enrich your, your uh, Bible studies and your preaching uh, or whatever, maybe whatever writing.
that you do on the text of Scripture. Very, very important. Um, in the back of Nesalalan, by the way, are all the Old Testament references that are alluded to or quoted in the New. It collects them all together. So you, you really do need this, uh, even though it's probably not part of your... I don't know. Do you, do you have this on Accordance? Accordance has this now. Wow. As a gift for enrolling in the PHS. Gee. Man, I need to get that. <laughs> Better not uh, trumpet that too much. That's <laughs> awesome. But some, uh, but I, I have it on my accordance. Yeah. So uh, you, you might. I don't know if you all have it or not. But I even have the margins on accordance. So. That's awesome. See, that's. Good. It's worth having it because of the back and because of every marginal page. It's really, I don't know. I, I don't know. You might, you might ask them. I mean, they, they, they do try to, you know. Yeah. Is that, is that like a preference thing, like a, a setting you were able to do? Or do you know? Or can you tell me? Like with the, how did you get the, the margins in there? Maybe we, I can get in a break. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I'll just show you what I have. I just set it up. I, I don't remember how I set it up now, but now it comes up that way. Yeah, well, that's what you want. So, it's got. It's also got the textual apparatus too, of, of Nesalalan. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's go to one text. Before we leave the analogical use, I, I want to uh, again. You know, sometimes they're pretty straightforward, and, and and sometimes, yeah, you can tell it's analogical. But it's not so easy to interpret. So I'd like you to uh, look with me, turn to 1 Corinthians. This is a really tough one. This is one that many people think that Paul clearly is misinterpreting the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 9. And uh, beginning at verse, uh, verse 8, Paul says, I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it's written in the law of Moses, you'll not muzzle the ox while he's threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written. Because the plowman ought to plow in hope, the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. So look at that phrase there, verse 9. He says, Deuteronomy 25.4 says, You'll not muzzle the ox while he's threshing. So this is not a prophecy. This is more like an ordinance. And so it's, it's at least analogical. and probably is. But then it says, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? In other words, God wasn't concerned at all. He wasn't speaking at all, really, about oxen. At least this is what some say Paul is saying. Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes. In other words, Moses wrote that text, according to Paul, for Christian preachers. And some would say, obviously Paul is misinterpreting the text. Obviously this had to do with oxen. And so Paul, Paul is really wildly applying this, thinking that all the way back, Deuteronomy 25.4, something about oxen applied really only to Christian preachers. Um, and here's what some people say about this text. Um, James Moffat says about this text. For Paul, the literal sense of the injunction had no significance at all. It is one drawback of mystical or allegorical interpretations that in extracting what is supposed to be the higher meaning of an Old Testament text or incident, the apostles often miss the profound direct significance of the literal statement. So um, he's really ex exalting his interpretative abilities here, um, uh, James Moffat. Uh, C.K. Barrett, well-known New Testament scholar, um, has said this, attempts to show that Paul did not mean that God did not care about the animals in Deuteronomy break down on the next clause where he says, or is he not speaking altogether on our account? In other words, Moses was speaking only about us. 
The only interpretation that is not forced is that in the Old Testament law, God had in mind not oxen, but Christian preachers and their needs. This has to be the way Paul is interpreting it. This does not mean that Paul would have denied the truth that God is concerned even over the fall of a sparrow, but that's not what he's thinking is going on in Deuteronomy 25.4. Um, so uh, my professor, who I studied under some time ago at Dallas Theological Seminary, which is where I went to seminary, um, and he wrote this little book that I've talked about, S. Lewis Johnson. He did a sabbatical at the University of Edinburgh uh, at one point, and he was listening to a lecture on systematic theology where the professor was beginning to talk about old and the new. And uh, he says this, I attended classes in dogmatics at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. A professor in one class made the point that the patristic authors continued and systematized what was begun in the Bible. He made two claims, the professor did. One, the apostles' minds were blown by the resurrection. And because of that, they looked back to the pre-resurrected Jesus. And then they sought to learn under the Spirit's teaching, as he had promised in John 14 and 16. And as they did that, number two, they looked again at the Old Testament, and they interpreted the resurrection by the Old Testament, and then they interpreted the Old Testament by the New Testament. It was not long before the fathers saw much in the first words of Genesis, uh, and too much. Then the professor added, quote, You'll get fed up with the way the fathers treat the Old Testament, and you'll get fed up with the way Paul does too. Take the incident of 1 Corinthians 9. Paul talks there about the oxen and other things. That was rather naughty of Paul. And my, my professor concludes, who was naughty, Paul or the professor? <laughs> So, um, this is a very, very debated text. So, let's, let's look at it. First of all, I do think it's a simple analogy, but it is very problematic. And I want you to look at it. I'll just put the English text here up because I know you haven't translated. Um, So he says, he quotes it, God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? And um, this phrase, altogether, is pantos, only, altogether. And you could, you could translate it uh, as, as only or simply, I've got a number of range of meanings here, surely? NIV has surely, or doubtless, certainly. Most of those translations make it seem that Paul, speaking only, completely, um, altogether, um, makes it seem like he sees only in Deuteronomy 25.4 a reference to apostles, which I do think would be a little, little strange. And, of course, they think that, that that's what he's doing. On the other hand, this word altogether can be translated, uh, if you look at, at the Bauer lexicon, as at least, um, or above all. So the RSV has, he's speaking entirely for our sake. That is Moses. Entirely, altogether. Uh, or is it, it all of a sudden makes a difference when he says, or is he speaking at least for our sake? Um, which means that Moses wasn't speaking only about apostles um, or above all for our sake. I think what Moses is doing here is taking something about oxen and going from the lesser to the greater. But it sounds difficult because of this word here. It makes it sound like Paul thought only altogether, um, or entirely. Uh, but that word altogether can be translated as at least above all. And that changes it. Uh, it shows that there is some aspect by which Paul could see that as referring to um, uh, literal oxen. Um, now, this is also difficult. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? The Greek word uh, for the negative here 
is May and expects a negative answer. No, he's not concerned. So some think together with this, the all together, and that, clearly, Paul couldn't have anything of Moses' uh, uh, literal idea in mind. He's just reading in, thinking this was only about apostles. But when the expected answer, no, God's not concerned about oxen, is he? I, th I think in light of this, at least, that, you know, it's a mild no, if you will. If you ask Paul, Paul, does God care about oxen? Of course he would have said yes. Now, having said that, and that, that's pretty much the route I go, but some think that this quotation here in Deuteronomy 25.4 has already become a proverb because every other verse in Deuteronomy 25 is about uh, justice in human relationships. And all of a sudden you get this, don't muzzle the ox while he's threshing. So some think it's already proverbial. If it's proverbial, then he's taking a proverb about justice and applying it to the apostles. Either way, um, it's, 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 a, it's an analogical use, using something that was intended to express justice among Israelites and now applying it to the apostles. Yeah. Was it used even in Deuteronomy from a lesser to a greater, like you shouldn't muzzle the ox so you can also maybe pay your workers or the only there? That's my first question. My second question is, there yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's not. Uh, that's the way it's used in Deuteronomy 24. It's just by itself. It just sticks out like a sore thumb. Okay. That's why some think that it was proverbial. Okay. And then the second question I have is, isn't there a lesser to greater thing right there in the context as well that would support your argument where he follows it with the plow and not the plow? Oh, so he moves it from, you shouldn't muzzle the you should give You should reward the oxen. You should also reward human beings who work hard in the crops. And then, if we so spiritual, is it too much to ask him what's So he's, there's quite he's a obviously thing. using an analogy that includes literal oxen here. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> often just read the text, you know. I'll put that in my notes. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love it. It assumes literal oxen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's great. Great. Very good. Okay. Um, it's interesting that in rabbinic literature, De Deuteronomy 25.4 was often used as a kind of principle for interpreting other texts uh, to, 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 to make clear a principle of justice. And, uh, and no rabbi suggests the literal meaning should be done away, even though they applied it with respect to justice in human relationships. So, um, okay. Now, let's go to another passage, uh, uh, actually another use, and it's uh, this use here, number uh, five. Number five. Uh, let me pull that. I've got it magnified too much. Okay. To indicate an abiding authority carried over from the Old Testament. Um, turn to Romans 3. Let's look at that. Romans chapter 3. Is that 6 or 5? I'm sorry, 6. Oh, I skipped 5. Thank you. Got to go to 5. Let's look at 5. Um, the symbolic use of the Old Testament. Now this could be considered a subset of the analogical use. Um, and here's what it is. A New Testament author will allude or quote from something that's clearly already a symbol in the Old Testament and carry it over and apply it to something in the New. The only difference is it's already a symbol. It's, it's probably still under the analogical category, but it's, it's symbolic, whereas the cases we've been looking at, they weren't symbolic. They were just events or institutions. So um, let me give you an example of that. I'd like you to turn. We'll turn to Romans 3 in a moment, but for now let's turn to Revelation chapter 13. 
Revelation 13. Revelation 13 and verse 1. And he stood on the sand of the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear. His mouth, the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Okay. I mean, this is obviously, you're in the midst of, of the symbolic section of the book of Revelation here. Um, does anybody have any... Uh, marginal references in their English Bibles. Do you see any Old Testament scripture by verses 1 to 3? Daniel. Daniel 7 in verse 1 and, and again a, a number of times in verse 1, again in verse 2. Um, and this indeed, uh, th this idea in, in Daniel 7, if you remember, Daniel sees coming out of a sea tossed here and that's tossed by the wind, four winds of heaven. He sees four beasts coming up from the sea. Uh, one is like a leopard, another a bear, another a lion. The fourth is uh, so horrific, he, he, he doesn't describe it as an animal, it's just, it, but it's more horrific than the others. And so... Here we find something very interesting. These three animals, at least, and, and by the way, some of the allusions here, um, <clears throat> as it goes on, a mouth speaking arrogant words. In verse 5, those given to him, a mouth speaking arrogant words. Um, that, 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 those are descriptions of the fourth beast. So, so we do get descriptions even of the fourth beast. All of a sudden, they're collapsed into one. And uh, into this one beast. Now, is it an institution? Is, is it a person? Well, I think that let's go to Daniel 7 and find out. In Daniel 7, it says that Daniel uh, saw kings. But as it goes on in the interpretative section, he saw kingdoms. So probably, you know, some people argue it's only an antichrist individual figure. Others will argue, no, it's, a, uh, it's an institution. Probably both and. Those are not mutually exclusive. And Daniel 7 helps us on that. Furthermore, um, some see this as only a vision of the yet future great tribulation. And um, I would say, myself, I do think it uh, includes that, but I think it includes more. I think it's the whole church age that climaxes in a great tribulation at the end of the church age. And, um, well, how would Daniel 7 help us with that? Because if it's true that this is about the church age, then it's not about any one particular age. Well, collapsing the four beasts into one figure. Uh, each of those beasts, the, 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 those king represent kingdoms that lasted hundreds of years. So collapsing those different uh, uh, temporal reigns of the beast into one may refer to uh, the, the trans-temporal nature of this, of this beast. Now, I'm, th th there's a certain level of speculation here because John doesn't say that. Um, I'm, I'm mainly letting the Old Testament be my key here. Okay? And I would say if you're in the book of Revelation, especially, you're going to have an Old Testament reference almost in every verse. I'll always go back to the Old Testament because it's such a hard book. It'll give you some kind of anchor. I kind of picture it as this. The book of Revelation is like an apocalyptic sea and there's a storm and you're almost drowning. And so if you can go to the Old Testament, you can stand on a sandbar and get your head above and not only not drown, but kind of see things and interpret them a little bit better. doesn't solve everything, but it goes... A good percentage of the way. So, um, so that may indicate that this is a trans-temporal beast. Um, you'll know even verse, you'll, you'll notice that this uh, beast uh, has heads and that uh, verse 3, one of his heads have been slain. And so uh, some think, you know, one head of the beast will arise in one age and another age and another age. 
that may support the idea of, of a trans-temporal figure here. Um, and collapsing them all into one as well may emphasize the horrific uh, uh, nature, the persecuting nature of this beast, especially as it climaxes in the, in the fourth beast. So th those are, so what, what it especially helps us with, by the way, besides those ideas, the clearest thing is that Daniel's beasts are political figures. So this is not a cultural antagonist, um, a religious antagonist. It is a political antagonist. Now, having said that, religion and politics were inseparable in the Roman Empire. So, um, and that was true in the, in the Old Testament as well. So we might not make such a big distinction between religious and political, but it's certainly, certainly it's the state here, and um, uh, that the, the evil, evil state and leaders of those states, which, which uh, transcend time and, and um, encompass the church age. And I think Daniel 7 helps us with, with all of that as another example. So that's a symbolic use of the Old Testament, taking a symbol from the Old, which applied to something in the Old, taking it over into the New, and applying it to something else. But it still has the same basic meaning. The idea, again, as an analogy, is that the symbolic pictures uh, denote principles of continuity, and, and you want to trace those. Um, all right. Finally, let's go to number six. Indicate an abiding authority carried over from the Old Testament. Um, we're coming now to something. So far, everything we've seen are uh, separate uses. You can't combine them, except maybe the symbolic use is a subcategory, but still you can tell when the symbol is being used as opposed just to an event or an institution. But here, uh, to indicate an abiding authority carried over from the Old Testament, this is something that could be true of the first five and um, even of the following. Let me give you an example. I mentioned Romans 3. If you turn there, please. Romans 3, and verse 4, Paul has said, uh, if some do not believe, in verse 3, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written that you might be justified in your words and might prevail when you are judged. And so that goes back to Psalm 51, verse 4, which is talking about uh, the notion that um, God will always be declared righteous in His words and will always prevail in judgment. Um, but it's introduced what, by as it is written. And uh, often that will be an introduction to an Old Testament quotation that uh, is affirming that, hey, this text was absolutely authoritative in the Old Testament about God's righteousness, and it is still absolutely authoritative. He is still absolutely authoritatively righteous. He'll always be declared righteous in His works. So uh, it introduces an abiding authority. Now, actually, everything up here there's always a principle of continuity. This stresses the authority. Now, actually, implicitly, that's also true in 1 to 5. This highlights it. And uh, as sometimes you need to, you need to be very careful because sometimes that formula of kathos gegraptai, as it is written, um, may introduce other uses of the Old Testament. But what it will always introduce is there's an abiding authority. Now, it may introduce an, an analogy. Well, it's the abiding authority of that analogy. In fact, our first Corinthians text, do not muzzle the ox while he's threshing, it's introduced with kathos kagrapti, as it is written. So the abiding authority of that text from Deuteronomy 24, uh, abiding authority, uh, that analogy has an abiding authority. So, so you, from here on, we're going to find that some of these uses could overlap. You can have 
overlapping uses. One to six, those are all distinct. And those are going to be your main uses. The others begin to be a little bit more refined. Okay? Um, and they can't overlap with the first um, five. So you believe that six would typically have the double type? A double, you, you mean, you know, in other words, indicate abiding authority in, in an analogy? analogy? Yeah, sure, yeah. Mainly because there's so many passages right. that come up at that point. Right. Now, in this text, it appears that it's just, it's, it's a principle of God's just, judgment, justice. So, you know... That, 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 that's pretty specific. But he does then introduce the same formula in, in verse 10 of chapter 3, where he says, uh, For we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin, in verse 9, as it is written, Kathoska Graptide, there's none righteous, not even one. And it goes through and it gives statements from the Psalms and Isaiah about depravity and sinfulness. So there's a principle. Whereas we had the principle of God being declared righteous, this is the opposite principle here applied to humans. Uh, so there's more, often it can be, just be used purely principially, and sometimes, uh, as in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, it, it can enter, the, the, the authority of the text is emphasized together with its analogical use. Now, the next use um, is difficult. I'm going to do my best to try to explain it. Most people won't talk about Most people won't break these uses down. In fact, when Don Carson and I uh, got uh, contributors to, uh, you know, we asked people to write different chapters of our book on the commentary on the New Testament use of the old. Um, a number of them weren't familiar with these. Uh, and, you know, that's understandable. People teach in a different way. They have their own style. Uh, and, and sometimes intuitively they would understand these different uses. So, uh, but I think it helps to spell these out um, uh, in, in the way that they're spelled out here so that you know, we can be more precise in the way we teach our Bible studies and in the way we preach, in the way we uh, express our interpretation of the Old Testament when we, when we write. Um, so these are handles, I think, interpretative handles that, that, that can help us on understanding old and the new. And in this particular case, uh, the proverbial use of the Old Testament is where an author uses an Old Testament word or phrase which, which has been used a lot elsewhere, whether in the Old Testament or in, in, the, in the, uh, the Greco-Roman world, even. Um, I, I also call it, uh, I used to call this the stock and trade use. The reason I called it that is because, you know, if you go to a hardware store, what's the stock and trade of the hardware store? Nails. And they deal in a lot of nails. And, and hammers and screwdrivers, a stock and trade. And so the stock and trade use is when an author uses something that's used a lot elsewhere. Okay? And, uh, and it has that common meaning. And, and, and it has a common meaning. Exactly right. Um, so it's a, re it's a repeated use of a word or phrase so much that it comes to have a common meaning. And then the New Testament writer will use that. Um, so let me give you some contemporary examples first. Um, you've heard of Watergate, uh, you know, the big Nixon scandal. Uh, and um, it was such a bad scandal and, and such a bad situation of corruption that whenever now anything in government gets corrupt. They'll say, oh my gosh, we've got this gate and we've got that gate. You've probably heard it, you know. We, you know, deflate gate. We get all these gates, you know. And so that, that, that's a stock and trade use. That's a proverbial use based, but all of it has that continued common meaning of corruption. Okay. Uh, or you've heard of uh, Waterloo. 
you know, if a football team looks like they've steamrolled, you know, maybe, the, you know, it's a college team, they beat every opponent by 50 points, they're in the championship game, and they get steamrolled. People will call that, well, that was their Waterloo. Well, what happened? What was Waterloo? It's where Napoleon was decisively defeated, and I think we can even say perhaps surprisingly. And so uh, when we use Waterloo, probably both those ideas, not only decisive defeat, but perhaps uh, unexpected, um, unexpected defeat. Certainly Napoleon was not expecting it. Um, um, or Vietnam. Uh, sometimes when we get involved in, whether it's in the Middle East, at one point it was Latin America under Reagan. Uh, some people say, oh, this is our Vietnam. Well, we don't need another Vietnam. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so this happens all the time. And um, I, let me give you a, uh, a couple of scriptural examples. <clears throat> And, I, and we're not going to look this one up. I'm just going to mention this one. But the phrase, um, uh, Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon, is found throughout the Old Testament. It's found throughout the Old Testament. Sometimes it's literal. They're enemies of Israel. And then sometimes it begins to be used for other enemies, even though they're not the literal Edomites. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they become the enemy. And you find this in Qumran. Qumran will use it for the Romans, for example. And... Uh, and so Qumran is, is familiar with this Old Testament stock and trade use. It's just all, used all over the place. Uh, Edom, Moab, and the sons of Adam, a Ammon. Is even Babylon like that a little bit too? Well, um, I do have Babylon here as one of my examples. Um, and uh, certainly you find it a lot in, uh, in Jeremiah. Um, it's the place of persecution. Um, it's used a whole lot in Judaism as that. In fact, Rome becomes Babylon. And that's the exile because it was the exile of Judaism at that time. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go in, in, into all the verses and all of that, but Babylon probably would be a good example of that. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I mean, she overran Jerusalem, just to, Rome overran Jerusalem, just as, as Babylon did. Yeah. Not only is there the notion of the exile and persecution, but overrunning um, and, 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 and conquering. But maybe one example, oh, I'll give you another example, by the way, here. Uh, mystery, the use of mystery. Uh, you find that quite a bit in um, the New Testament. And... Um, See here. Just a minute. Ah, I know where I am. Second. There we are. <laughs> Just a moment. Yeah, here we go. Look how much uh, this word mysterion is used in the New Testament. I mean, a massive amount of time. Uh, and you'll notice it's used in certain corpuses, only three Gospels, Paul, and Revelation, Revelation 17, 5, uh, mystery, Babylon the Great. Um, so it's used quite a bit. And if you notice here, um, the dots by all of these represent the observation that each of those uses are directly connected to either Old Testament quotations or allusions. 
That's why I said earlier that mystery has a lot to do with the use of the old and the new. So all these dots, there's hardly any use that in some way is not related to the Old Testament. I think even these in 1 Corinthians 13 and 14 are related, but I'm not going to push that for now. I had a student who did the use of uh, mystery in uh, 1 Corinthians as a, a Wheaton PhD dissertation, did a very good job. In fact, we teamed up and did this book on uh, Hidden But Now Revealed, a Biblical Theology and Mystery, which we cover every one of these uses in that, in that book. But um, this word mystery was used like mad in Qumran. It's just all over the place in Qumran. And uh, so certainly, at least in one sector of early Judaism, which Qumran is, this, this, this word uh, had a stock and trade use. And you can see in the New Testament itself, it's used quite a bit. Uh, so what, what's going on? Well, when you look at these then, not only do these dots represent uh, uh, places where mystery is integrally related with an Old Testament quotation or allusion, but almost all of them are about inaugurated fulfillment. Why the use of mystery? Because inaugurated fulfillment is all often surprising. It's surprising. And this was the most, this is why we wrote this book, because there are many people, including evangelicals, including Reformed evangelicals, who say that when mystery is used, it's showing it's a brand new interpretation of the old, that the Old Testament author had no, uh, no, no idea about. It might even contradict what the Old Testament author said. It was a mystery, okay? And uh, what we did is we began to go through here and began to look at these uses and found that, yes, while some of these are surprising uses, uh, for example, here in Matthew 13, 11, uh, the mysteries of the kingdom of God, how are they explained? Through the parables. But the parables are unexpected forms of the kingdom. Remember, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, when, when uh, the kingdom came, uh, the wicked were to be separated from the righteous, righteous rewarded, wicked judged. Oh, Jesus, in the parable of the tares, says, let them grow up together. The kingdom of God is like this. Very interesting. Or uh, the parable of the mustard seed. This tree is going to grow very slowly. The Old Testament looks like wham, blap, when the kingdom comes, that's it. And it's going to grow slowly. And you're going to see it. Well, Jesus says it's like leaven, grows invisibly. So are these, uh, these are unexpected, but are they contradictory to the Old Testament? Now, I would say that they are not. And, and part of the key as to why is because um, this is part of the key. When you look at the Old Testament, and this is probably its origin, I'm giving you here an overhead here of where mystery first appears in the Old Testament canon. It's Daniel. Now, you'll notice that it looks like there's a lot here. Well, there's, you know, it's, you know, what, seven or eight uses. But this represents the, what's called the Old Greek of Daniel. And there are two Greek uh, uh, texts of Daniel. This is what's called Theodotion, T-H. And uh, this Theodotion is much more careful. It's, it's a much more straightforward translation of the Hebrew, uh, or in this case, the Aramaic. And, and this is much more interpretative. But at any rate, they both used mystery about the same Amount. So this is the origin of it, just like Nixon's Watergate, okay? This is the origin of it. So if you can find out what it means there, that should help us. And, um, of course, if you remember, in, in Daniel 2, the king has a dream. No one can interpret it. Finally, Daniel can interpret it. And, uh, and the king won't even tell him the dream because most dream uh, interpreters say, give me your dream and I'll interpret it, okay? King said, no, I want to know that you're the real thing to the, to, the, to the Babylonian soothsayers. So you tell me the dream and interpret it. Well, Daniel could do that because God revealed it to him. And um, so you could think there that um, uh, perhaps the revelation of this dream was uh, something that no one had any inclination about. Um, and especially the king did not understand 
uh, the interpretation of his dream. We, we know that. That's, that's quite clear. Uh, so just looking at the king himself, he had a revelation of the dream, and, uh, but he didn't seem to understand the interpretation of it. That could seem to support the notion that New Testament writers are uh, revealing things that had never been understood before. But we went to uh, the other passage in Daniel 4. And, uh, and, and if you turn to Daniel 4, I want you to turn there very quickly. Now, ooh, golly. We'll, clue, we'll conclude with this. Daniel 4. So the king has a dream. And, um, and here it is. In Daniel 4.11, the tree grew large, became strong, its height reached the sky, it was visible to the end of the earth, foliage beautiful, fruit abundant, beasts of the field made shade under it, birds of the sky, living creatures fed themselves from it. Then, I, then the king is explaining, he's explaining this uh, here um, to, to Daniel. Because he says, I'm going to tell you the dream, you give me its interpretation. It's Pesher, by the way. Peshro, uh, in, in Hebrew. Uh, in, in Aramaic, I believe, I believe it's, it's, it's Petar. Um, but then in verse 13, I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, descended. He shouted out and spoke as follows, chop down the tree, <clears throat> cut off its branches, strip off its foliage, scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it, and the birds from its branches, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, uh, with a band of iron around it, in the new grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him share with the beasts of the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man. Let a beast's mind given, be given to him. Let seven periods of time pass over him. Uh, the sentence is the decree of the angelic watchers, the decisions and command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler of the realm of mankind, bestows it on whom he wishes, sets it over the lowliest of men. Now, that is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is... So, so he, gets, he gets this image of a tree that's cut down, but he, got, he gets a partial interpretation of it. But he doesn't have enough. And so he wants Daniel to solve the mystery. He knows some of it. He knows that it deals with a man. Uh, because, verse 16, his, his heart will be changed from uh, that of a man. Beast given to it. And he knows it's about a, a ruler. Because the Most High is ruler of the realm bestows it on whom he wishes, sets it over lowliest of men. And I think he's afraid it's about him. But he wants this thing fleshed out much more. And so he asks Daniel. He lays out the dream and its partial interpretation. And then Daniel uh, confirms and fleshes out the dream. I think that that's what's going on in the New Testament. You have kind of a seed. Uh, your hardest boss is known for this famous illustration that the Old Testament is the seed, the New Testament uh, is, is, is the flower. Um, and uh, whereas Daniel 2 is unclear to me in terms of uh, th th this, this issue of uh, whether something's completely hidden or not, I think this uh, clarifies uh, this, this uh, vision. So in, in, in the New Testament, when the writers are quoting Old Testament texts, it says we're revealing the mystery of the meaning of this text. I think already the Old Testament authors had some meaning of it that now is being expanded. It's not just that they had no understanding. The New Testament writers are giving them a new, maybe contradictory understanding. No, it grows out of that partial understanding, just as Daniel's interpretation grew out of Nebuchadnezzar's partial understanding. Um, so, so that, I mean, all in the kind of the envelope of the mystery that's being revealed is the plan and the will of God. Well, in various, in, uh, it's about particular topics, exactly. But, but like the, this overall plan that like the kingdom. Right, the kingdom, different, different aspects of this plan is being revealed. Exactly, yeah. And I, I think that's interesting, too. I, I'm not, I don't want to take this too far, but, you know, just to think about uh, it's being revealed to a king. Right. To be interpreted, but it's more fully made known through the king as he interprets interesting. that will. Well, it, it, I'd have to think more about that, but 
What's intriguing about what you say is that in Matthew 24, there is a quotation from Daniel 4 in explaining the kingdom. And uh, you'll remember it. It's, um, it's this, Matthew 13. He says, um, let's see here. Yeah, verse 32, where he's talking about the mustard seed. He says, this is smaller than all other seeds in 1332, but when it is full grown, it's larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that, quote, the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. That's Daniel 4.12. That's part of the king's explanation of his dream, yeah. which is very intriguing. Now, I'd have to think more about whether there's really an, an analogical or even typological relationship between the king and Jesus. Yeah, is there a pattern or a model? But that, 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 that gives you some reason maybe to inquire into that. That's very, isn't that intriguing? That's very intriguing. So well, we're, we're 10 minutes, uh, or, or, you know, much over. So we'll have to stop. So, but basically, uh, a stock and trade is the use of something so much. And then the New Testament writer uh, will use it. And it will have that, that common meaning. The meaning may have changed a little bit, but it will not have lost its basic meaning. Just as the meaning of uh, deflate gate and so forth and so on. I mean, obviously, there's a little different uh, 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 meaning, but the, the same idea of corruption is always in mind. And so, so it is with mystery. Now, sometimes, quite frankly, sometimes Daniel 2 is in mind with the use of, of mystery, which makes a lot of sense, too. But when it's not, it probably still had its origin with Daniel, just as the flake gate had its origin with uh, uh, Watergate. So, uh, so there are a lot of Yeah. Or, you know, like yeah. That. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I guess maybe the proverbial is more of a statement. Um, well, I mean, proverbial is, I mean, you know, proverbs are based on observations of many, many episodes that are alike. Okay. So, you know, the early bird gets the worm and so forth. So, but yeah, it could be, it could be a subset of, of, of the analogical. It could be, yeah. It's a, thanks. Yeah, it, it, it could be. Okay, we better quit so we have a little time to rest. We'll continue.